um, the switches because um, I can have transparent switching, uh, transparent firewall inside the switch, but I'm not going to cover that part. Uh, for that, I prefer to use a firewall. But here, uh, what I'm going to do is to add about four rudders. One of them is going to represent internet. The other one is going to represent the firewall. Actually, most of the configuration is going to uh, be uh, configured on that rudder. I have another rudder that represents my inside network and another one that is going to represent my DMZ network. The configuration is so easy. Once I did it, you can see that most of the lessons are going to use that topology. And after that, I'm going to start with access list. Most of us know how to use access list, but uh, I'm going to, you know, uh, go about access list in detail. I'm going to talk about access list in detail. Normally we are going to have numbered and named access list and they have standard and extended types. We have of course other types of access list that we do not cover here because they are not used in our course. And um, one of the features that you need to know about that is you can have an access list edited in place without having to remove it and create it and again. So I'm going to talk about editing. I'm going to talk about different options that you have inside an access list. I'm going to create time ranges and talk about time-based access list. This is very, very nice whenever you want to have an access list enabled in certain times of the day or months or even year. Then I'm going to talk about reflexive access list. This one again is going to show you basic functionality of a stateful firewall. And of course, this is not a stateful firewall, but as I told you, this is the basic functionality and the basic theory of a firewall. Then I'm going to talk about authentication, authorization, and accounting. And this is AAA. This is called AAA. Uh, in this section, before I go through AAA, I'm going to show you how you can assign different passwords for console and uh, enable mode in your system. Whenever you want to log into your system, you need to assign, a, you need to have a password. And this one is very important because anybody who accesses the router physically can, you know, connect his laptop to that router or, and, and then, you know, change the configuration as he or she wishes. This is not what we want. What I'm going to do is to make sure that uh, everything is password protected. So this is the first one and then I will go to AAA. We can make sure that the passwords are not uh, managed on this router. This is for maximum security. You can have radio servers, you can have TechX servers that, uh, manages, that manage the authentication and authorization on your router. Then I'm going to create different privilege levels. I'm going to discuss about the default privilege levels and the commands that you can execute under those privilege levels. And I will show you how you can assign different commands to different privilege levels so that whenever some user, some admin actually, has a certain uh, privilege, um, he or she cannot execute more commands than what is assigned to him or her. And then I'm going to talk about role-based CLI. This one is very interesting because you can have different roles and uh, under those roles you can have different admins. This is a much better and much granular way to, uh, way to you know, manage your router security. And then I'm going to talk about different login options. Uh, whenever you try to log into your router remotely, you need to, you know, configure some options such as timeout, such as the password and, and the number of connections that you need to have. Um, all of them are going to be discussed in this part. Then I have some, um, you know, um, context-based access list and then zone-based firewalls. These are very nice when you're talking about firewall features and actually ZBF or zone-based firewall is a most interesting one. This um, this is not full feature firewall, but most of the features are are supported under ZBF, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in detail. And again, I'm not going to show you every detail about zone-based firewall because not all of them are useful. But the most important ones are 
uh, discussed in detail. And finally, we have some other features that I'm going to talk about, such as using policy maps and class maps to to drop or to you know manage the traffic. I'm going to talk about traffic export this one. I'm going to have an example for that. And finally, I'm going to show you different features that inspect TCP connections. And actually, you can kind of manage UDP connections as well. But you know that UDP is connectionless. What we are talking about is the number of you know connections that user tries to create, uh, cr tries to establish to our router. I'm going to talk about them in detail. So these are the uh, topics. Um, in summary and I hope that they are interesting for you and I hope that uh, you are with me in this course so that we can examine these features. Okay, let's go and create a simple project. You can find the files for this project ready for download from the uh, from the course curriculum. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to create a project in this folder. I'm going to copy this uh, path and I'm going to paste it in location and I'm going to give it this a name. I'm going to name this PR01. So click on OK. So there's a project here. It says uh, there is already some folder here. Do you want uh, to override it? That's okay. Just click on yes and everything is going to be fine. Now, this is the free canvas here, the, the blank canvas here that I can add my rudders to. So I have, as I told you, two different images. One of them is for 7200s. As I told you, this is version 15. I'm going to use this and also I have version 12.4 uh, on 3725 series. I'm not going to use this. Uh, this has a lot of bugs for, for GNS3. This is not good. So what I'm going to do is to use version 15. There may be a very, very little differences between the versions, syntaxes and different versions. Um, I'm going to give you enough information so that you can work on your version 12 if you have such gear. So I'm going to add this to topology. This is going to be my router one. Uh, another router is going to act as a firewall. That's going to be router two. Another router here is going to be inside my uh, DMZ in perimeter network. And this one is going to be uh, internet. So this is the basic configuration that I have. Let's go and add some uh, some interfaces to these routers. I'm selecting all of them and I right click on one of them and click on configure to make sure that all of them have the same configuration I click on router C 7200 group. So this group I'm going to go to slots and I'm adding an additional fast Ethernet or even serial interfaces. It doesn't matter which one I'm just adding some interfaces to this router so that I can add uh, multiple you know connection between these routers. So let's go for the connection. Click on this button. I'm going to connect pass 00 from router 1 to fast 00 from router 2. Pass 01 from router 2 to fast 01 from router 3. And I'm going to connect serial 10 from router 2 to serial 10 to router 4 and disable the links. I'm going to move them. Let's be clean. So I click all of these, uh, select all of these and go to align them horizontally. And also these two, I'm going to align them vertically. That's it. Now it is beautiful. So let's add some graphics so that we can recognize different parts of our network easier. So let's select this one. I'm going to click it here, then click it on, click on it, and this will give me a handle that I can change the shape like this. I'm going to move this backwards. So I click on this, right click on this and click on lower one layer. I'm not going to see these tips again. Now let's select another one, click here. And again, by clicking on that, I'm going to be able to change the diagram like this and I'm going to right click on that and right click on this of course 
like this and click on lower one layer and I'm going to add one more so this goes here and I'm going to extend it to this much okay so let's right click on that and lower this one layer too. So we have three rudders, four rudders actually, rudder one, rudder two, this is rudder four, and this is rudder three. Now what I'm going to do is to give these uh, graphics a good color so that I can distinguish different parts of these, uh, this network. I'm right clicking on this and going to style from here I'm going to select a field color this is my enterprise so that's gonna be green or uh, uh, a brighter green that's okay I click on okay and click on okay this one is going to be public network so that's a little dangerous so I click on a style and go and select a red color for that like this and click on OK and this one is my DMZ the perimeter network the perimeter network is somehow I need to be cautious about here so yellow is good color for this now let's add some writings this one is gonna be my enterprise and uh, the IP address is 10 10 12 0 slash 24 that's it let's move this inside so that I can say this better or on the outside that's better let's select another one this is gonna be internet and the the link between router 2 and router 4 that connects me to the ISP is going to be uh, one uh, one 124 0 slash 24 that's it and here is my DMZ so the IP address is going to be this right DMZ the IP address is going to be 10 10 23 0 slash 24 okay this is my diagram a simple diagram with colors and you know links and everything so that I can recognize what I am uh, doing in the next section I'm going to start the routers and do the configuration okay this is my simple topology whatever you do just make sure that you press this button save project so that every configuration and everything that you have done to your topology it's going to be saved to your file and you're not going to lose any hard work okay now I'm going to start my routers I'm going to start them one by one because if you start all of them at once you may experience uh, some some bad lag or you know hang on your system uh, because 7200 series is a little uh, you know heavy uh, the loading is going to be a little heavy on your system so that's not good to run all of them at once going to start one by one or two by two at least so this is going to start and I'm going to start router two as well and I'm using secure CRT to connect these routers as I told you I'm going to start this and this is router two let's go and wait for for these images to load you can see the CPU usage right now it is high and it is going to say hi as long as the rudders are going to load and then it is going to lower like this when this is lower uh, I can start other rudders as well so let's now click on this and rudder 3 and 4 are going to start as well so this is rudder 3 and this is rudder 4 rudder 1 is loaded completely rudder 2 is loaded completely it takes some time for rudder 3 and rudder 4 to load and then I go to configuration so let's start the configuration on rudder 1 and of course rudder 3 and 4 loaded 
Okay, let's go to router 1 and start the configuration. I want to clear the screen, go to configuration mode, interface pass 00, 00 is connected to router 2, so the IP address is going to be 10, 10, 20, uh, 12, 1, and this is the no shut command. I'm going to have an interface of a loopback type. The IP address is going to be 1111 24 bits for this. Uh, let's enable an IGP protocol such as EIGRP. No auto summary. Uh, networks are going to be 1111 and 10, 10, 12, 1. Okay, and this is the IGRP process. Let's go to router 2. Router 2 has the most interfaces. So router 2, let's clear the screen and go to configuration mode. Interface pass 0, 0 connects to router 1. So that's going to be 10, 10, uh, 12, 2. No shutdown. Interface fast 01 connects to the DMZ router, so that's going to be 23. No shut. Interface serial 10 connects to uh, internet, so that was 24, and this was 1, 1, 24, based on the topology, that's it. Hit enter and no shot. I'm not going to change the encapsulation, but based on the connection that you have to your ISP, you have to change the encapsulation and, and enable authentication or whatever uh, you have in your agreements. So let's create a loopback interface as well. The IP address is going to be 2222 24-bit. And rather EIGRP1, no auto summary. I'm going to add interfaces one by one. Network 2222000. Network 10, 12, 10, 10, 12, 2. And network 10, 10. 23 to. I'm not going to add anything to the link between router 2 and router port. So let's first create a default route by exiting and typing IP route uh, 0000000. I'm going to send every packet for this destination to 1124254. Uh, that's going to be the IP address of the interface that connects to router 2. And in router EIGRP1, I'm going to redistribute static. And uh, the metric is going to be a dummy metric, like this. And hit enter. Now if I go to router 1 and check IP route, I can see that I have access to different interfaces that I've advertised to me. Let me run this once again. And the static route is not yet. I don't see the static route yet. But if I go to router 2 and make sure that I have redistributed the show run uh, section router EIGRP. This should be like that. And it says I have a redistributed a static with a metric of 11111. That's okay, so. Oh, that's it. Uh, because router 4 is not configured yet, there is no route from router 2 to router 4, so the static route is not going to be in my routing table. Let's see if I check my IP routing table. I do not see the static route here because this is not reachable yet. That's okay. That's completely okay because after configuring router 4, 
I can see the static route. So let's go to router 3. I go to configuration mode and let's clear the screen so that I can have a better view of what I am doing. Interface fast 01 is connected to router 2. So the IP address is going to be 10, 10, 3. And no shutdown. And a loopback interface, of course. IP address is going to be 3333 24-bit mask. And let's go for IGP configuration. No auto summary. Network 3333. And network 101023. And after some time, I should see the EIGRP, IJS, and see everything is working just fine. Let's go to router 4. On router 4, I'm going to have multiple loopback interfaces. And also, interface serial 10 has an IP address of 1124254. 24 bits with no shot. And interface loopback 100, IP address is going to be 100, 100, 100, 100, 24 bit. Interface loopback 101, that's going to be 101, 101, 101, 101. 255, 255, 255, 0. And let's have another one. Interface look like 102. And the IP address is going to be like this. 102, 102, 102, 102. And now that we are creating different interfaces, let's have another one. So this is going to be 103, 103, 103, 103. Okay, I'm going to have a static route back to the enterprise. So I type IP route. The network is 1010. 10. I can have a better summary, but just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to type this. Uh, 0, 0, 255, 255. Or no. That's not going to be this. That's going to be simple mask. And I'm going to forward every traffic for this destination to 11242. Hit enter. Now let's check the reachability. If I go to router 1 and check IP routing again, now I see the static route here. Advertise the default route is here. So if I try to ping 100, 100, 100, 100, that's reachable. So everything is working just fine. And let's try this thing from another router, from router 3. And the thing is working just fine. Everything is working just fine. So make sure that everything is saved. And I'm going to write memory the old way. So let's go here and type write memory. And router 3, I'm going to end and type write memory. And router 4, I do the same thing. And when everything is OK, that means the writing is done. Again, I come here and push this button to make sure that everything is saved. In this section, I'm going to start a discussion on access control list or ACLs in brief. And what I am going to do is to show you different types of access control lists first. Then I'm going to start creating different types and show you the effect of applying those access control lists to different uh, contexts, such as uh, an interface. We have basically two types of access lists. The first one that is older is a numbered access list, and it has a standard version or extended version. The second part type that is newer is a named access list, 
and again it has a standard and extended versions both do the same thing exactly the same thing so when you want to create an access list you can go with a numbered or a named access list it doesn't matter whatever you are uh, comfortable with that's gonna do but why do we go for named instead of numbered in most cases that's because because when you create a named access list you can give it a descriptive name when you have a descriptive name you can easily figure out what this access list is written for where this access list is going to be applied how this is going to you know filter the traffic that we, we we desire that so this is easy to guess but when you are encountered with a numbered access list you say oh my god what is this unless you have enough documentation for that you are going to have a hard time troubleshooting a numbered access list so basically I I suggest you go with named but just writing a numbered access list is easier that's why we still stick uh, with numbered access list and again we have two different versions of access list we have a standard access list for both they are the same again and we have extended access list again both are the same for number and named a standard access list is used to control traffic for a specific network that's it you cannot do anything more than that but with extended access list you can apply a lot of criteria to your access list you can have time range you can have port numbers you can have different types of traffic you can have uh, you know QoS checking a lot of different criteria and God knows how many uh, you can apply all of them to a uh, uh, extended access list so let's just start with a standard access list and I'm going to start with a number of the standard access list so let's go to GNS3 and load the project from recent project because this has been the most recent project that is there and I'm going to start rudders and while rudders are loading let's go for our scenario uh, I have my enterprise here and users from my enterprise want to connect to internet I'm not going to let them to connect to any suffix on internet you know that we have different uh, prefixes not suffixes of course we have different prefixes in internet we have hundred 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 zero slash 24 and we have hundred one one oh one one oh one zero slash 24 one oh two one oh two one oh two zero slash 24 and one oh three uh, 103, 103, 0 slash 24. These are the prefixes that we have here. Let me increase the size of this one. I'm going to make it a little bigger than what it is. So, so that it doesn't work like this. Okay, that's it. Uh, I'm not going to let my users to connect to 103, but I'm going to let users to connect to 1. 100, 101, 102, but not 103. That's a specific spam server or uh, a network that I feel that's terrible for my network or a download server that my users are using, uh, uh, you know, obsessively. I don't like them to connect to this specific network. What I need to do is to apply an access list to one of the interfaces on router 2. Either the outgoing interface to router 4 or the incoming interface to router 2. Router 2 is going to stop this traffic from being forwarded to router 4. Or I can ask my ISP, that's going to be my router 4, to stop my users from sending traffic to this specific network and router 4 is going to do that on our behalf. But because internet is not um, a small area and, and and we do not have authority to you know change anything on internet we are going to do this on our own network router 2 is the best place to apply this access list so let's go to router 2 and on router 2 let's clear this I'm going to create a numbered access list so 
I go to configuration mode and I start with access list. If I want to create a named access list, I need to start this with IP access list. But uh, this is a numbered one. So access list and after that I need to assign a number. As I uh, have in my slide, 1 through 99. If you choose a number between these two, uh, iOS is going to treat this as a standard access list. If you select a number between 100 and 199, iOS is going to treat this as a named, as extended access list. And of course, there is another range for um, IP, but you do not see that range actually here. Oh, uh, no, that's it. 2000 to 2699, that is for extended access list, other range. And 1300 to 1999, that's going to be an expanded range for IP access list. But we we stick with these two. They are better. So let's start with number one. Before doing that, make sure that there is no such thing as the number that you are going to choose. Because if you create an access list that already exists on your iOS, it is going to uh, be overridden. Or, you know, um, at least it is going to be merged with that. So before doing this, make sure that you do this step do show access list and you can see that there is no access list right now I type access list and the number is going to be 1 and next thing it asks me it says do you want to deny some packets do you want to permit some packets or do you want to type a command um, I'm not going to use remark but sometimes you need to have uh, some kind of documentation so remark is a good tool for that I'm going to deny traffic to 103, 103, 103, and uh, 0. And next thing it asks me, it says uh, specify a subnet, a wildcard mask, or a subnet mask. I'm going to specify a subnet mask here, that's going to be 24. And next thing it asks me, it says, do you want to look this? If there is a breach, you want to know about that. So this type of traffic is going to be stopped. I hit enter and that's it. Now there is something that you need to consider. Access lists can have a lot of lines. You can have multiple lines per one access list. And remember, the last line that is added to your access list automatically denies any traffic that's very important that's very important the last line is there implicitly it is added to any access list and it denies any traffic that you haven't allowed on your access list so basically I'm telling this access list that deny this traffic and deny any other traffic because I haven't added any permit to this access list any other traffic is going to be denied but remember if you have multiple lines in your access list this is going to be processed sequentially so the first line is going to be uh, processed against a specific kind of traffic if that traffic matches this line the traffic is going to be treated respectively either deny or permit if not it goes to the second line the second line is going to be uh, processed against this traffic again if there is a match that is going to be treated respectively if not the third line the fourth line so on and so forth until we have no more lines if the traffic does not match with any of these lines it is going to be dropped it is going to be dropped this is very important to understand right now you see that I only have a deny so after that we have an implicit deny that drops anything else so this is very important to know now what I'm going to do is to add another line of commands so I type access list one I'm going to permit anything else so hit enter now 
what I need to do is to apply this to the interface. I am denying any traffic from this, this, uh, from this uh, network. So nothing comes back from this network. Now, what should I do? Do I need to apply it here on, on the serial link? So the traffic that comes from this uh, destination is going to be dropped. Basically, this means that there will be no reply for the requests that come from Enterprise. Or I can apply it here. Because the traffic is going to come in my network from serial link, I'm going to apply this here, the closest interface to the destination. And the traffic is inbound, so I'm going to uh, deny any traffic inbound on router 2. Let's go to router 2 and go to interface serial 10. I need to type IP access group and the access list number is 1. And next it asks me, do you want to remove inbound traffic or outbound traffic? I'm going to remove inbound traffic. Any traffic that comes in with this criteria is going to be dropped on router 2. Okay, let's test this. Let's go to router 1. I'm going to ping 100, 100, 100, 100. The traffic is forwarded successfully. Let's ping 103, 103, 103, 103. This traffic is not forwarded. And you can see there is a problem with this traffic. This says the traffic does not have a response. So this is one type of, you know, denying the traffic from this specific network. And let's go to router 2. What I'm going to do is to go to privilege mode and start the debug. I'm going to debug ICMP. Debug, of course, IP ICMP, I guess. And that's it. ICMP traffic is debugged. Now if I go to router 1 and start the ping once again. Now if I go to router 2, I will see some log messages. It says, this is unreachable. The destination 10.10.12.1 and the source is 103, 103, 103, 103. Basically, the, the source of the traffic is this. This is stopped. I cannot reach, I cannot send any traffic from this to this destination. This is administratively prohibited and unreachable. Now let's do something. I'm going to go to router 4 that is internet. I'm going to try, uh, I'm going to, to try a ping from outside and I'm going to see the result. What I'm going to do is to do this. 10 10, uh, 12, 1. I'm pinging this and to make sure that this traffic is, is originated from my loopback interface, I'm going to change the source to loopback 103 and hit enter. Now you see the messages here. It says this is unreachable. This is uh, different from the messages that I have here. That's because this traffic is sent to router 2, router 2 stops and sends a response to router 4 and says your traffic is unreachable. Okay, assume that I am a malicious hacker. I am sitting on router 4 and try to hack your network and I see this and instantly I understand that there is an access list on the way. So I know that this destination exists. Now this is success for me because I have guessed the, the architecture of your network and I know that you have implemented an access list on the way that I cannot go through that. So I will sit and try to uh, figure out a way to do that. But if you are an administrator and if you are a good administrator, what you will do is to go to router 2 and you will go to the interface that has the access list serial 10 and you will type no IP unreachable and when you hit enter if I try to reach your 
network once again I do not see these unreachable messages and I see these timeouts and I cannot guess if there is if, if this is the right destination or the wrong destination this is very important to understand okay I'm going to continue my discussion in the next section and I'm going to talk about different versions in previous section I created a numbered access list that was a standard one of course and I implemented that in this interface the serial interface of router 2 because that was the closest interface to the origin of uh, that traffic now I'm going to get the same result using a named access list so how can I do that let's go to router 2 first and I'm going to use show access list to see what I have I have an access list and the name is 1 and it has two lines the first line this is just a sequence number it is just uh, it just shows the order of operation the first one denies traffic to this and it has 35 matches that means uh, there were 35 packets that matched against this one and the second line we are permitting any other traffic so this has 10 matches and you can see that everything is working just fine what I'm going to do is to use the same syntax but with named access list so I create an IP access list when you start this with IP you mean that you are using a named access list and next thing you need to specify here is to choose uh, to use a standard access list or an extended access list what I'm going to do is to use a standard access list so after that I need to have a name I said its name was 1 and I really meant that you cannot say that this is a number for an access list actually we call this numbered access list because the name was a number but actually that was a name you can see that from here you can have number 1 through 99 and you will get an, a standard IP access list but what I am going to do is to assign it a name the name is the most important thing here because it gives me a description of what this access list is going to do so what I'm going to do is to deny 103 uh, network this is gonna be the name and from this name I can easily you know imply that this is denying the traffic that comes or goes to travel to, to network 103 and I hit enter now again I can deny and I can permit or I can remark what I'm going to do is to deny the first line is to deny uh, 103 103 103 0 and it asks me again a wildcard bit and this time you are using a wildcard bit this is very important to understand so I am going to type in 0, 0, 0, 00255 and you know how to use a wildcard bit whatever you have here you can add it to the network ID and you will get the, the, the last IP address that is in this range the first IP address is going to be 103 103 103 if you add 0 to 103 0 to 103 again 0 to 103 and the fourth octet 255 to this fourth octet 0 you will get 103 103 103 255 as the last address of the range that you are denying okay there is no other option except login I'm going to talk about login later so I hit enter and again you should know that there is an implicit deny at the end of any access list that you create whether that is a numbered one or that's a named one so I know that if I do not permit anything no traffic is going to go through this interface so I need to permit other traffic so I type permit any other traffic and hit enter now if I show access list you can see that I have two access lists the first one's name is one and it has two lines the second one's name is deny 103 network and it has two lines so the second one is more descriptive and you can easily grasp the idea
So what I need to do is to go to interface serial 1, 0 and I am going to, let me show the running config of interface serial 1, 0. What I'm going to do is to remove this no IP access group 1 and I'm going to type IP access group and this time I'm going to use the name the name was deny 103 network and again that's going to be inbound and hit enter so if I uh, test this on router 1 if I try to ping 100 100 100 100, 100 that's successful. If I try to ping 103, 103, 103, 103, again you can see that the traffic has no way of entering my network. I can do the same thing from the other side. If I go to router 4 and try that ping once again using the source of loopback 103, again you can see that this doesn't go through. And because I have uh, done a wise move using this command. In this section I'm going to show you how you can edit an access list. And by edit I mean changing the criteria that you have used in defining that access list. This is very important in that uh, you may have used that access list to filter some specific traffic. You have applied it to an interface or you have used that access list in another place. I don't care. Right now I have applied it to one interface. And if I go and remove that access list, the filter is going to be removed and the traffic that is unwanted is going to, you know, disturb my network. I don't want this to happen. What I want to do is to make sure that that is there and as soon as I make the change, everything is going to be in effect. I'm not going to delete an access list and redefine it. I'm just going to make very simple changes. And sometimes you have an access list that has a lot of entries. You know, when removing an access list, all of those entries are going to be removed. And unless you have a saved version of that or a documentation for that, it is going to be very, very hard to restore uh, your hard work. So make sure that you only edit and make sure before that you are going to save any configuration that is unsaved. And of course, uh, make a backup of what your configuration has been. So let's go to router 4. I'm going to, uh, uh, router 2 of course, I'm going to make some changes to the, to the access list that I had created. Let me clear the screen. And I start with show access list. And right now you can see that I have two access lists. First one is no longer in use. I can safely remove it. But before that, I need to make sure that I'm not using this in any place. And the second one, I'm using the second one. So let me see this one. Uh, what I'm going to do is to show run. And I'm going to include access. And with this, I make sure that uh, my access lists are there. You can see that IP access group, this is the only access list that is in use. And this one is the definition of the access list. And this one again is the definition of access list. So I can safely remove this because I don't see any reference to this access list in any of my configuration. So I go to configuration mode and I type no access list one. And this removes an access list. So if I try to show access list once again, you can see that there is only one access list. Okay, let's say that this is not uh, the network that I am going to uh, deny the traffic from. Uh, actually, the network was 102, 102, 102, 102. That was the network that I wanted to deny the traffic from. So what I need to do is to uh, change this. But again, you can see that if I add uh, another line that's going to have a new sequence number that's going to go after line 20 and this is not acceptable because line 20 takes priority over that you know that the access list entry are going to be processed in order so the first line is going to be processed first the second line 
then and then the other lines. So if I add an entry and it goes under line 20, that's not going to be processed when there is a permit any is here. So I need to make sure that I am editing exactly this line. How can I do that? What is the name of this access list? It is deny 103 network. And you can see that the this is an, a standard access list. So I start by defining a standard access list with the exact same name. IP access list. And you can see that I am using IP access list. And, and this was a standard access list. And I'm going to paste the name and hit enter. Right now you can see that I am under this context, the standard named access list definition. How can I change this? What I need to do is to specify the sequence number first. So I am I am editing sequence number 10. And I type deny and I'm going to deny 102.102.102.0 and the wildcard message is going to be 0.00.255 and hit enter. Now you can see that it says there is a duplicate sequence number. So what I need to do is first to remove line 10 by typing no 10 and hit enter and now I am adding another line with this sequence number, sequence number number 10 and that is denying 102, 102, 102, 0. So first of all you need to remove that line but that line and not the whole access list and then add your desired line. So let's see what the access list looks like. It is like this. Right now it says I'm denying 102, 102, 102, 0 with this wildcard mask. And the second line is still the second line. There is no problem. Now let's uh, go and check this. If I try to ping 103, 103, 103, 103, now the ping is successful. What if I want to ping 102, 102, 102, 102? Now you see that traffic for this network is being denied. Okay, let's go back to 102, or rather 2, and, and uh, enable the previous um, configuration. So I'm going to type no 10, and I'm going to make this again 103. And everything is the same as before. What about editing a numbered access list. Assuming that I am defining a new access list. So let me define this. I'm going to define access list 10 and uh, it is denying for example 100, 100, 100, 0 and permitting anything else. Uh, Wait, let me see that. It should be like this. Because I need to reference the same access list. Many times. Okay. Now you can see that I have two lines. The first line is this. Denying network 100. The second line is permitting anything else, any other source. So if I show access list 10 and hit enter, this is what it looks like. So assume that the first line is not correct. I'm going to edit it. So how can I do that? And again I go with this definition. IP access list standard and because this is a standard access list you see the number it is between 1 and 99 so this is going to be a standard access list so what is the name the name is 10 and once again which line I am I, I am editing I am editing line number 10 so I type no 10 line number 10 is removed now I am defining this one once again And now if I try to show access less 10, you can see that there is a very, very 
bad problem here. That's because I forgot to add the sequence number in front of this. This is a problem. So you type no 30 and instead of that line I type 10 deny 101 101 101 zero. Now if I try to show access list once again you can see that everything is correctly defined here. So this is how you edit an access list. In this section I'm going to show you different options for access list. I told you that you can match a network and I told you you can do that using a wildcard mask. And I said that for example if you have a network of 100, 100, 100, 0 and the wildcard mask is 0, 0, 0, 255 this is an example of course you can add this value with this value. I'm going to move this around like this and what I'm going to do is to add the values together and the sum is going to be 100 the second octet is going to be 100 the third octet is going to be 100 and the fourth octet is going to be 255 so the range of IP addresses is from 100, 100, 100, 0 to 100, 100, 100, 255. Any address in between is going to be matched using this access list. Uh, so you know that the wildcard mask doesn't have to look like this. You can assign any number to these values. For example, this one can be 2, this one can be 200, this one can be, for example, 101, and this one can be, for example, 25. So any number. Uh, you can have any number for your wildcard mask and, and as I told you if you want to match an IP address you need to make sure that anything that you are matching falls into this range. Now I'm going to give you another keyword. You can specifically go and match with an IP address. For this you can use a keyword host. A keyword host basically means that the wildcard mask is 0, 0, 0, 0. So the end and start in IP address for your range is one number. And you can match with any. The keyword any means that you are using 0, 0, 0, 0 network with a wildcard mask of 255, 255, 255, 255. So basically this means that all IP before addresses. So you can use these two as a means of, you know, not defining the range using wildcard mask. But again, these two both means you're using a specific wildcard mask. Now, let me give you an example and show you how this works. Assuming that I have another network that has uh, the first eight octets like this one. 103, uh, the, two, the first two octets of course like this one. The first 16 bits are the same as the loopback 103. So that's going to be 103, 103. For example, 104, 0. And let me define this. This is better shown as an example. Let's go to router 4 first. I'm going to define interface loopback 104. And the IP address is going to be 103, 103, 104. 104 and the mask is going to be 24 bits. So if I show IP interfaces in brief, now you can see that I have two IP addresses with the same two octets, the same first two octets. Now I'm going to go to router 2 and I'm going to change the, uh, the access list that I had previously. What I need to do is to remove this. I'm going to type no IP access list. Let me see the list of IP access list, of course. Show IP access list. And these are the access lists that I have. I'm going to remove this. I don't need this. So I type no access list 10. And I'm going to remove this as well. So I type no IP access list standard 
and this is the name. I'm going to define this once again. IP access list is under the NI103 network. Now I'm going to deny 103.103.0.0 the wildcard message is going to be 00.255.255 and then permit any. So the first line means any network that starts with these two octets 103.103 is going to be denied. That means that I am denying these two networks. So if I go to router 1 and try to ping 103, 103, 103, 103, that's going to be denied. Uh, let me try this one now. 103, 103, 104, 104. This one is going to be denied as well. I'm not going to deny this one because this one should be uh, reachable. So I need to go to router 2 and make some changes to this uh, access list. So first of all, I need to see the sequence number. So I type show IP access list. And I have two entries here. First of all, I need to make sure that this network and exactly this network is permitted. So if I want to make sure that this one is permitted, I need to use this. Uh, I type a sequence number that is before denying because if I do that after this for line 10 that's going to be denied in the first place because it is a match with the first phrase I'm not going to do that I'm going to type a sequence number for example number 5 and I'm going to permit and you can see that I have any and host as a keywords I type host 103, 103, 104, 104 and hit enter. Now if I try to show access list I can see that this permit is before this deny and any packet to this specific destination is going to be permitted. So let's go to router 1 and make sure that this happens. So if I try this you can see that uh, the traffic is permitted but the other network is still denied. So this is a very nice way to change IP access list. In previous sections I showed you how you can use a standard access list named ones or numbered ones to stop or permit uh, traffic from specific sources. That was all it had to offer you. But if you want to have more control over the source and the destination or the type of traffic or the time of traffic or some other features of a traffic you cannot use a standard access list you need to go with extended access list let me show you what you can do using an extended access list first of all I'm going to type access list and this is a numbered one you can use a named one it doesn't matter but just for simplicity uh, need to assign a number between 100 and 199 so that we can have an extended access list and next thing I can have a deny statement I can have a permitted statement and I can have a dynamic statement this one is very interesting and I'm talking about that in detail in the next section using the dynamic access list you can uh, let the iOS itself to create entries on the fly whenever it needs some entry it creates that entry applies it to a specific type of traffic and whenever it is no longer needed it is going to remove that entry so that's very nice uh, assuming that I am denying or permitting a specific type of traffic for example denying and next thing oh my god all types of protocols are supported I can go with normal IP traffic I can go with ICMP I can even apply it to tunnels like this I can go with routing protocols I can you know use all types of traffic basically all types of traffic some of them have well-known names such as these some of them they do not have names so I need to go with the protocol number 
this is very interesting and the other thing if I choose IP and next thing I need to assign is the source address so for example I'm assigning this network 10 10 uh, 1 0 and it asks me for a wildcard mask so that's gonna be 0, 0, 0, 0.0.0.255 for example and the destination the destination is 1 2 3 0 and 0, 0, 0, 0.0.0.255 is the mask for that now see what we have here uh, for IP you can see that I can go uh, with a time range basically this means that for a specific range of time I can deny the traffic but this is not going to work in other times I can use type of service based on the you know, QoS values that are assigned to a packet uh, precedence gives you the same option you can go with options that are assigned to this IP packet you can go with fragmented packets uh, you can you know basically do anything with an IP packet let's go and change this if this is not an IP if this is an ICMP let's see what happens if this is an ICMP packet you have other types of uh, you know possibilities you can go with you know different types of ICMP messages is it an echo message a ping is it the reply for that ping is it uh, telnet or no not telnet of course telnet is a TCP packet is it um, you know anything basically anything on um, ICMP is supported here uh, is it administratively prohibited or uh, different types so let's go and change this if this is not an ICMP if this is a TCP packet let's see what happens if this is a TCP packet I will get other types of uh, possibilities is this an acknowledgement is this uh, equal to a specific port is it a established TCP packet is this a finished message is this a fragmented message is this greater than a specific port number is it less than a specific port number is it not equal to a specific port number you know all the possibilities here you can have this for different types of traffic and for each type of traffic it gives you other types you know other possibilities you you, you get a lot of options here okay what I'm going to do is to you know deny telnet for example so telnet you know telnet is a TCP uh, traffic so I just type EQ that means it's equal to and I know the port number is 23 but let me see what types of uh, 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 port numbers are supported basically any port can be uh, denied or permitted but some of them again have well-known numbers you can see that for example telnet is here you can type 23 or you can type telnet for simplicity I type telnet if I type 23 again it is going to replace it with telnet okay and next thing uh, what about telnet do you want to have again different types of you know features assigned to that or is it just that you want to hit enter and that's it I hit enter so basically what I created here it says if I want to let me go to the beginning of this access list if I want to deny a TCP packet from this network 10.10.1.0 basically that's going to be um, nothing I haven't created that yet uh, from 10.10.1.0 10 to 1.2.3.0 and if that traffic is telnet I can do that I can do that okay let me remove this okay now let's do something what I'm going to do is to um, to create a username and password on router 3 and let router 1 to telnet router 3 uh, first of all I want to make sure that anybody from 10.10.12.0 is unable to telnet router 3 
but from 1110 the talent is going to be successful so let's do this I go to rudder 2 and I'm going to apply that to rudder 2 and rudder 2 I'm going to create access list 100 and this is going to deny traffic that is of type TCP from this source 10 10 12 0 0 0 0 to 55 to this destination 10 10 23 0 0 0 0 to 55 and because this is a TCP traffic I can check the port numbers and control the port numbers a specifically telnet is going to be denied so I just go with equal to 23 or equal to telnet both of them are accepted and I hit enter now I need to permit other types of traffic because you know that at the end of any access list there is going to be an implicit deny for any other type of traffic so what I'm going to do is to type access list 100 and I'm going to permit IP from any source to any source when you write IP this means that any type of traffic is allowed here or denied here so IP is inclusive any type of traffic is included inside IP and hit enter now if I check show access list 100 you can see that I have two lines of commands the first one is denying telnet from this source to this destination the second one is permitting any type of traffic now I need to apply this to a interface which interface is good I can apply it to this inbound or I can apply it here outbound because you know that the uh, direction of traffic is this way so I can use this as an interface that receives the traffic and filter this or I can use this interface as, a, as an interface that you know sends the traffic so this should be out one I prefer to apply the access list to the closest interface to the source so this one is better I'm going to apply it here inbound so let's go to router 2 and first of all I want to show running config of interface fast 0, 0 to make sure that nothing is applied there and nothing is applied there and before applying that to router 2 let me go to router 1 and make sure that I can tell not router 3 uh, if I go to router 3 I forgot to create a username and a password so first of all let's type a username Cisco and a password a simple password Cisco here and go to line VTY and I'm choosing 0 to 10 that's enough because I'm not going to let anybody else to use other numbers and I type login local login using local database and basically the local database has only one entry that's okay so now router 3 is telnetable so let's go to router 1 and try to telnet router 3 before applying the access list if I type telnet uh, 10 10 23 3 and I'm going to specifically type a source interface so I type source interface and fast 0 0 you know that fast 0 0 is IP address is 10 10 12 1 so now you can see that the talent is successful so if I type Cisco and the password Cisco uh, I can tell not to uh, router 3 so let's go to router 2 go to interface fast 0 0 and type IP access group 100 inbound now I have applied this if I go to router 1 and try to tell it once again this time it says destination is unreachable I cannot use an IP address in that range 10 10 12 to reach to this destination because it is stopped if I go to router 2 and type show access list you can see that there is one match here that means a traffic trying to reach to this destination is denied 
So let's go back to router 1 and try another interface for the source. For example, loopback 0. This time, the telnet is successful. Why? Because I am using an IP address not in that range. Now if I try to check access, as you can see that I have matches with other type of traffic and this is increasing because we have EIGRP packets coming and going and other types of traffic and telnet is also in that uh, range. That's it. Now you can see that this is one of the possibilities. Okay, let's continue our discussion with a good scenario. A good example here is this. We have an FTP server in the internet. This FTP server contains some music and video and my users connect to this FTP server and download music and video. This is not good for their job because this stops them from doing their job. What I'm going to do is to drop this traffic. This traffic comes from router 4, enters router 2, and goes to other routers. So the direction is quite uh, obvious. This is either this way or that way. But I know that the incoming interface is this one, the serial interface here. So what I'm going to do is to drop this traffic, the inbound FTP traffic from any sources, and I mean any sources because this is the only interface that is connected to internet, and this interface uh, receives uh, traffic from any destination, and I'm not going to let my users to uh, download from FTP servers in internet. It doesn't matter which server, I'm not going to let them to download that. So this should be one way, because I have an FTP server here. Now I'm going to let internet users to, you know, to reach to this DMZ server and download their files, the files that I am selling, for example. So how can I achieve this goal? What I'm going to do is to create an extended access list that drops or denies FTP traffic from any sources to any destination, and by any destination I mean I have only two parts in my network. One part is this enterprise part and one part is this DMZ part. So a, by any I mean these two sections in my network. I'm not going to let any user from these two to download from FTP servers in internet. But at the meantime I'm not uh, stopping the outgoing traffic. So I'm not going to apply this outbound. I'm going to apply this only inbound. So let's go and do this. What I'm going to do is to go to router 2 and first of all, I want to check my access list. Let me clear the screen and type show access list to see what we have here. There is no access list right now on router 2. So let's go to configuration mode and create an access list that denies FTP from any source or any destination. That's going to be this IP access list. I'm using the new context, uh, the new syntax, because I want to have a good name for the access list that I'm creative. Uh, a, a descriptive name is good for this. This is going to be an extended access list, and that's going to be no FTP download. Hit enter. I'm going to deny. The type of traffic is TCP, the source is any, the destination is any, and it equals to, and now I can see what type of traffic I can uh, match. You can see that I am denying TCP, and the port number can be specified here. So I know the port number for FTP is 20 for data and 21 for uh, control. So I can type 20 or 21. But here you can see that FTP and FTP data have their well-known name. So I can either specify the port number or the name. Doesn't matter which one you choose. I go with the name. So I'm denying FTP. I'm denying FTP data. And finally, because there is an implicit deny at the end of any access list, I need to make sure that other traffic can transport uh, through router 2. So I am permitting IP from any source to any destination and hit enter. 
Now what I'm going to do is to apply this to interface serial 1, 0. That's going to be applied inbound. So I go to interface serial 1, 0. And before doing this, I'm going to uh, test to make sure that right now FTP data goes through this interface and after applying, this cannot go through. So let's go to router 4. First of all, I'm going to um, I'm going to create a data uh, similar to FTP. So what I'm going to do is to telnet, and telnet you know that this is a TCP traffic. I'm going to telnet 10, 10, 12, 1. This is router 1. But I'm going to use a port number that is not 23. The port number for telnet is 23, but I'm going to use another port number, port number 20. If I hit enter, you can see that it says connection refused by remote host. This means that my traffic reaches router 1, but for some reason router 1 is refusing this. That's okay. Uh, what I wanted to know is that I wanted to know that router 1 is receiving this traffic. So let's go to router 2 and, and, and apply this to serial 1, 0. Uh, that's going to be this IP access group um, the name of the access list is no FTP download and I'm going to apply this inbound. That's it. Now let's try the telnet once again. If I try telnet once again, now you can see that traffic does not go through router 2 because this is uh, matching with one of the one of the entries in my access list. Let me see that. If I type do show access list, I can see that deny FTP data has two matches. Now let's try another port. You know that FTP has two ports, 21. If I try this, you can see that the connection is timing out. It doesn't go through, it doesn't reach to the other one. So if I go to router 2 and try this, I can see that right now for FTP I have two matches. So this is working just fine. Let's change the scenario a little bit. I'm not a bad boss, so I'm going to let my users to download music, but not in office hours. They can, you know, schedule a download program to download their music and video in an off hour, for example, when um, midnight or sometime after that. So what I need to create is a time range because the time range can be used inside an access list. Using that time range, I can activate the access list in some time or remove that in other times. How can I do that? Let's go to router 2 and create a time range here. So what I'm going to do is to create a time range. Let me exit from here and clear the screen and the time range has a name. A name can be office time. Okay, and inside this I can create an absolute time or date. What I'm going to have is a periodic date and time because this is recurring. So that's going to be weekdays and it starts from 9 in the morning to 17 in the evening and and let me see it says periodic weekdays start time oh it shouldn't have seconds I just added some seconds to that so from 9 to 17 and hit enter that's the time range that I have so I'm going to use this time range inside the access list so if I try to uh, show the running config of section access list and in the meantime I'm going to have show access list because I want to have the number of entries uh, you can see that I have uh, line 10 here, I'm going to go to this access list and hit enter. I'm going to remove line 10 
and instead I'm going to replace it with the new line of data. This is going to be this, deny TCP any any equal to FTP, but I'm going to add a time range. The time range's name is office time. So let's find it and copy that. Okay, and hit enter. For line 20, I'm going to do the same thing. So I type no 20 to remove this line, but instead I'm going to add this line one more time with a time range, of course. That's it. Now line 30 is there, so if I show access list one more time, I can see that line, oh my god, I forgot to, forgot to do this, no 40, I should remove this one. And instead I'm going to have this line once again, but the number should be there. So let's see what we have here. Now everything is working. Now you can see that this line is inactive. That's because of the time. And this line is inactive as well. So let's see what time is it on my router. Show clock. Using show clock it says that right now it is 21 in the night. So I'm going to change the time and make sure that this is working. But before this you can see that this is inactive. So if I go to router 4 and try to telnet connection reaches to router 1. Now I'm going to router 2 and what I'm going to do is to go to privilege mode because setting the clock is only available here using clock set and assuming uh, now it is uh, 1 in the afternoon so I type 13 and the date is 1 January 2016 and hit enter. Now if I try to see access list you can see that these two are active because now it is office time and if I go to router 4 and try to send the traffic, send the FTP traffic it doesn't go through router 2 because of the time range In this section, I'm going to talk about reflexive access list. Reflexive access list is not so common, but uh, you need to know about that. And how does this work and what do I use uh, this for? Whenever I want to deny any inbound connection, I apply an access list to the interface like this. For example, this one is going to deny any inbound connection, so nobody is going to be able to initiate a connection from outside to my network. This is a good thing because uh, I am stopping any hacker from being able to reach to my network. But there is one problem. What if I want to initiate a connection from inside to outside? And for the reply, I need some traffic. But this traffic comes here and gets stuck because the access list that I have applied here is stopping this type of traffic. So basically when I try to initiate the traffic, I do not receive anything. How can I solve this? I need to enable one of the features such as reflexive access list. With reflexive access list, I make sure that for any connection that is made from inside to outside, there is something in a state table. And this state table uh, keeps every information for the uh, initiated connections. So when it sees that I am sourcing a traffic, for example, from this segment of network to a server here, uh, it writes an entry here for the source and for the destination and for the source port and for the source, uh, you know, destination port. Everything is here. And, and it creates an entry and adds it to the access list that is denying the traffic. And with that entry, it pokes a hole through this access list and lets the returning traffic pass through it and reaches to the source of that traffic. So basically, you know that when you are doing this, you need to you know reverse this one. So the source is going to be destination, the destination is going to be source, the destination port is here and the source port is here. This one is a dynamic entry. And for a dynamic entry, we have a timeout 
and this timeout is normally about 300 seconds or 5 minutes and after that this is going to time out and get deleted. I'm going to show this in a nice example. What I'm going to do is to deny all type of traffic inbound and only let ICMP traffic to go outbound. You, need, you know that for any ping that you send you need to receive a reply. So I'm going to let a reflexive access list create an entry for the inbound replies of that uh, echo messages. So let's go to router 2. First of all, I want to make sure that there is no access list here. So I type show access list and there is one, no FTP download. I'm going to deny it. I'm going to delete it. So I type configuration terminal and I'm going to type no IP access list uh, extended no FTP download. So this is extended no FTP download. And I uh, check running config of interface serial 1.0 and it says that this is applied I'm going to remove it so interface serial 1.0 no IP access group no FTP download inbound okay the first thing that I'm going to do is to create an IP access list that denies inbound traffic this is going to be an extended access list. Under this, I'm going to deny any traffic inbound. I do not need to add an entry because there is an implicit deny for any access list, but just for clarity, I just type deny IP any any. Okay? Sometimes you write this because you want to add a login to your uh, log services, so for example, your syslog service. Uh, when you do this, you type deny IP any any log, but you know that login uses CPU, so you do not normally go for that unless you know that there's a threat that you need to have some information about that. You go for that. Here, I only have one thing, and it says deny IP any any. What I'm going to do is to create another IP access list. This access list is outbound and it is extended, and it is outbound traffic okay under this one I am permitting ICMP from any source to any destination and finally again I do not need to type this but I just type it for clarity deny IP any any so if I show IP access list or show access list both will work. You can see that the first one denies everything, the second one permits ICMP outbound but denies any other IP. Okay, now before applying this to the interface I want to make sure that from inside I can ping outside. That's it. And I just want to make sure that from outside I can ping inside. So this means that I can initiate connection from outbound, uh, from outside to inside. That's it. Now let's go to router 2. If I go to interface serial 1.0 and type IP access group uh, in deny inbound, inbound and type IP access group outbound traffic out and hit enter now if I show access list right now there is nothing here but if I try to ping from router 1 the ping is not successful you see that the ping does not work although I know that ICMP traffic goes out so let's go to router 4 and figure out the problem if I come here and type debug ICMP to check to see if there is a message here debug IP ICMP deck. I guess that's debug IP ICMP now if I go to router 1 and try to ping once again router 4 receives the traffic that's my intention router 4 tries to send an echo reply to this destination again this is my purpose but router 2 stops it because there is an access list here that says no inbound traffic is allowed 
Now if I try to see the access list, I can see that there are matches for this one. And of course there are matches that denies the return in traffic. How can I solve this? As I told you, I need to make sure that there is an estate table that keeps track of these traffics that I have initiated. So for returning a uh, response for that traffic, the poke is going the hole is going to be open. The hole is going to be poked through the firewall and basically brother two is working as a firewall. So it is going to let the returning traffic come, but no traffic should be initiated from outside. The unsolicited traffic is not allowed, better to say like this. Uh, so let's go and type IP access list uh, outbound traffic and here I'm going to remove line 10 and I'm going to recreate line 10 like this permit ICMP any any but I am reflecting this to an access list that is going to be created dynamically and I name it reflect and hit enter that's it now I know that whenever there is a traffic from inside to outside it is going to be reflected to a to a dynamic access list to a reflexive access list better to say a reflective access list and it keeps track of the traffic. Now for the uh, this for, for this one IP access list extended deny inbound. I just want to add a line. For example line five that is processed before line ten that is denying anything. I am going to evaluate reflect. This is the dynamic access list that is going to be created. I am evaluating that to make sure that there is no entry inside it. If there is an entry, I'm going to process that. If there is nothing, that's okay. And hit enter. Now let's see the access list. Show access list. And it say the first one that denies, it evaluates a dynamic access list, a reflexive access list, better to say. The second one is creating that reflexive access list. Right now you can see that there is a reflexive access list that says its name is reflect and there is no entry under that. Let's go to router one and initiate the ping once again. You can see this time pings work. Ping works. So if I go to router 2 and check access list once again, I can see that there is an entry under this reflexive access list that says permit ICMP from this source that initiated the traffic to this host that is the destination of the traffic. I can see that there are 10 matches here and the time left, you can see that it is, uh, you know, counting down from 300. 300 is the default uh, value. You can uh, go to global configuration mode and type IP reflexive list and there is a timeout value that you can set from one second to uh, a long time but 300 seconds are okay uh, for me. Uh, what about router 4? Can it initiate the connection now? With this if I try to send a ping to uh, this is my IP address, uh, 10, 10, 12, 1, you can see that this is not successful. It doesn't work because sometimes we were mistakenly checking this IP address, but uh, right now you can see that this doesn't work because the access list on router 2 doesn't let it work. So if I try to show access list once again uh, nothing matches here there is no new entry in reflect and you can see that this deny has 15 matches and everything works just fine as I wanted 
In this section, I'm going to show you another example of using an access list. I'm going to use this inside a route map. I'm going to use that route map for policy-based routing. This is not the best practice, of course, to drop messages using a policy-based routing route map. I'm just showing because I want you to know that this is possible as well. So let's go to router 2 first. First of all, I want to make sure that there is no access list here, nothing. What I'm going to do is to create an access list that permits all ICMP messages. I am permitting these ICMP messages because I want to make sure that this access list uh, you know, matches all of those ICMP messages. This is not going to deny them. It is just being used by another uh, procedure such as a route map. So I type, uh, I can use an um, IP access list that is a named access list or I can use a numbered access list based on your preference. So this is going to be for example ICMP messages or better to say ping messages. That's a better idea. Pings and I'm going to match this like this. Permit ICMP any any and that's going to be equal to or no that's going to be echo. Now hit enter. This is the uh, access list that I'm using. Now I'm going to use this inside the route map. The route map is a PBR and inside this route map I am matching this access list using match IP address pings clause. I can have more matches such as match interface and that's going to be the interface that these messages come in. That's going to be serial one zero. And I can match another criteria such as the length or let me see what I can match. I can match using uh, ASPAT. These are for BGP community. Uh, this is again for BGP interface, the incoming interface for uh, for the message. I can go with length. I can check the length of the message. I mean, uh, how many bytes are this? I can go with metric or uh, I can go with route type. These are for OSPF or EIGRP. I can match with tags. A lot of items are here to match with. So these two are good. So whatever message is received with this criteria, I'm going to drop it. The first, uh, the, the best way to do this is to set interface to null zero. Null zero is an interface that, uh, you know, that is like a, a discarding interface. Whatever you forward to null zero, it's going to be discarded. That's it. Now I'm going to use this under serial one zero. So if I go to interface serial one zero, I can use IP policy command and match it with a route map and the route map name was PBR. But before applying this, I want to make sure that pings are working. If I go to router one, I try to ping 100, 100, 100, 100. Ping works just fine. If I go to rather far and try to ping this, you can see again ping works just fine. Of course, not this IP address. I should go with this. Now you can see that from outside I can reach inside, from inside I can reach outside. But whenever I apply this route map to interface router 2, if I go to router 1, ping works because I uh, dropped only echo messages that come from outside. Well, if I go to router 4 and try the ping, you can see the ping doesn't work because it is sending echo messages that uh, get stuck in this interface because there is an access list that permits them and there is uh, uh, a route map that uh, sets the the uh, set the interface to null zero, so everything is getting discarded on router two. 
What about other types of messages? I just uh, use echo messages. I just, you know, filtered echo messages. So if go, I go to router 4 and I initiate another ICMP message such as, such as trace 10, 10, 12, 1, that's going to be successful. So only one type of messages, you know, filtered and that's a good, um, that's a good approach. In this section, I'm going to show you how we can use a feature inside an access list that helps us have information about the data matched by that access list. I mean, whenever you use an access list, whether you use it directly under interface configuration or use it um, under a class map or route map, wherever you use that, that access list is going to match some traffic. So you want to know uh, what traffic has been matched by that access list, you enable login for that access list. How? I'm going to show you in this configuration. First of all, you can type IP access list and you can see there are some information here about login or updating the log. This means um, you are sending information to a server. This one means you are logging. So I'm going to use log update first because this is an option that sets a threshold. That means I'm not going to send the messages one by one to the server. I'm going to aggregate messages. I'm going to um, wait until I have 10 messages, 20 messages or whatever you set here and then send it to the server. This way I am sending chunks of messages instead of sending one by one. That's a better option. You can aggregate as much as 2 billion messages and send them at once, but I prefer to have about 10 messages. And that's it. And hit enter. This means that I will wait until there are 10 messages in the bucket and then spill it out. Okay, next thing, IP access list. The option is about login. And you can see that there are some options here, such as interval. Uh, you know that this login is going to put a lot of burden on your CPU because these messages are going to be process switched. So if you have a lot of traffic that is matched with this access list, it is not a wise move to enable login for that. But you may want to enable login for a short period of time because you are suspected in some 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 you know suspicious traffic. So what you need to do is to make sure that it is not going to uh, crash your system. It is not going to put a lot of weight on the CPU. So what you do is this: you set an interval and say that uh, for every uh, for example, 500 milliseconds, only one of the logs are going to be processed using the CPU. Or for every 250 milliseconds, that means one quarter of a second, only one message is going to be processed with that CPU. This is very important because you uh, do not want to, you know, push your CPU to the, to the limits. And that's it. Hit enter. These are the most important configuration here. So let's create an IP access list here. I type IP access list extended extended and I'm going to match telnet traffic. Specifically I'm matching telnet traffic because I want to have some information about that. And for this I'm going to permit TCP any any that's going to be equal to telnet. And because I want to have information about this uh, specific traffic, I need to enable login for this. So what I need to do is to type uh, log if I want to have information about the traffic or a log input if I want to have information about the traffic and the interface that, is, that has sent that traffic. I mean, the MAC address of the sender is going to be included in the log messages. Which one do you want? If you are interested in having more information, go for log input. If you, um, if you want just enough information to get the 
get it going just type log I prefer to use log but as I told you if you want to have MAC address of the sender go for log input and this is not going to block any other traffic so I type I uh, permit IP any any and hit enter this access list does not do anything special it just uh, matches the telnet traffic and gives me information about that traffic okay now I need to go to interface for example serial 10 and I'm going to have this enable IP access group uh, the name is going to be telnet and input hit enter now let's see how can we um, how can we use this login feature I go to router 4 and initiate a telnet traffic telnet 10 10 23 3 and the username is going to be Cisco the password is going to be Cisco and you can see that I am in router 3 is console if I go to router 2 I can see some log entries here it says the list telnet permitted a TCP and there is one packet here and after that another TCP and there are 10 packets here sender is 1124254 the sender port is 55000 something the destination port is 23 and the destination is 10.10.23.3 so this is the information that is logged here you can of course log to buffer you can send the information to a log server I'm going to talk about this later but right now you can see that this uh, is working if I show access list of course can, I can have some information about the packets that are matched here but I am interested in this one because this gives me more information about what is happening in my network in this section I'm going to show you how you can drop packets with options we drop them because uh, maybe we are not uh, interested in them maybe because they are using a lot of resources on our devices we do not want to process them because they are process switched and they put a lot of pressure on our CPU we do not have to uh, have them so how can I do that uh, specifically the packets with options that come from internet I'm not interested in them so I'm going to drop them there are two different ways to do that one of them is to use IP options drop you can have IP options and you can see there is a drop command here and that's it if you do this it says RSVP and other protocol that use IP option packets may not function as expected right now I do not use any RSVP reservations so I'm not interested in options that's it but as I told you I I can do this on specific interfaces not on whole rather I may have uh, phone calls inside my network so I need to have RSVP so I just go for uh, dropping them on a specific interfaces such as the serial interface that is connected to internet I want to drop packets with options that come uh, toward my routers so first of all I need to have an extended access list and I mean extended because options can be matched using an extended access list so I type IP access list and this access list I uh, is going to be that's going to be an extended one and it is drop packets with options and enter and now what I'm going to do is to match packets with that now I can use this under an interface I can use this inside the policy map so if I'm going to use inside the policy map um, what I need to do is to permit these packets and then drop it inside the policy map if I want to use it under an interface configuration I need to deny them and then apply this as an access group inside interface configuration so this is up to you if I want to apply a lot of uh, access list a lot of options inside an uh, interface I, I will go with the policy map here I'm going to use just 
an access group so I just deny it deny IP any any because any packet even the transit ones I'm going to drop them and next thing I want to drop packets with options and if I press uh, question mark and get help you can see that different types of options are here some of them are you know familiar such as this one loose one or strict one some others we may not know uh, until we go and study about them so what I'm going to do is to drop any so I type any and hit enter this way packets with any options are going to be dropped and next thing I'm going to permit IP from any to any so any other IP packet that does not have any option they are going to be permitted so let's go to interface serial 10 this interface is connected to internet I'm going to have an access group the access group name is going to be this drop packet with options and I'm going to apply it inbound that's it now let's go to Rutherford and try to ping if I ping 10 10 12 1 you can see the ping is successful but if I try to ping this with options I just type ping the protocol is IP target IP address is going to be 10 10 12 1 repeat count I'm going to have the default one 5 datagram size the default timeout default extended commands yes I type Y for that source address or interface default type of service default set DF bit default validity default data header default and now this is where we can set some options such as loose one strict one record I just go for strict one and hit enter source route is it gonna be a source route uh, I use one one twenty four two fifty four and hit enter and again it says lose strict once again I'm going to have strict and hit enter and only one source options is allowed that's okay and hit enter right now you can see that after hit and enter is going to timeout because it will not pass rudder 2 now if I go to rudder 2 let's wait for this done and it's finished if I go here and show access list I can see the matches it says five matches have been there and five matches have been for the previous ping that was successful because uh, the first ping I didn't have use any option but in the second ping I used some options and those options are going to be denied because there is a deny uh, deny a phrase for this access list in this section I'm going to talk about some miscellaneous commands and then I will go and explore passwords and routers right now you can see that when I load my router and hit enter I go straight to the privilege mode or enable mode you see that here uh, the prompt says that I go straight to privilege mode why do I go straight to privilege mode while this is not a good practice if I try to show running config and I'm going to begin from line console and hit enter you can see there is one line of command under line console and under line auxiliary and of course the VTY doesn't have such thing the auxiliary and the console these two have this line of command of course this one that says anybody who tries to enter is going to receive a privilege level of 15 and 15 is the highest level that means you are the administrator of this router you need to remove this and make sure that whenever somebody tries to enter enable he is asked for a password and he is not given access straight to to the privilege mode how can I do that let's go to configuration mode and first of all I want to type line console 0 and hit enter and I'm going to remove this line of command from console and of course it is a good practice to remove it from line auxiliary some routers do not have auxiliary port but some have so should you should do this and this way when you go to privilege mode and exit if you hit enter once again you go to user mode 
and if you try to type enable then you will go to the privilege mode now what I want what I want to do is to make sure that you are uh, required to provide a password for this I need to go to configuration mode and because this is the enable command that takes us to privilege mode I will type enable and after that password for enable is for example Cisco this is a simple password now if I type end and exit you can see that by pressing enter I go to user mode if I try to go to enable mode or privilege mode I am required to provide the password I type the password you see that this doesn't appear on the screen but it reads the password and then I will be taken to uh, privilege mode. Now let's show the running config and I'm going to include any command that has password inside this. There is one line of command and it says enable password Cisco. This is dangerous isn't it? If somebody sees this password, if somebody take a glance at the screen while you are checking the running configuration he will know the password and next time when he connects to this router via console or auxiliary port he will be able to reach to global configuration and make changes whether that change is good or bad it doesn't matter we don't want anybody who is not authorized to connect to this router and enter the configuration mode so what I need is to make sure that this password is not readable how can I do that there are two ways one is better than the other one way is to make sure that service password encryption is enabled if I do this let me do that if I do this any password that is already on my system is going to change to encrypted mode this encryption of course is reversible so if someone tries he will be able to recover the actual password and he will be able to log in but if I try to show run here this time including the password command you can see that the actual password now is encrypted now from now on if I type a command that contains a password keyword it is going to be encrypted what if I want to remove this command what if I want to you know disable the password encryption service uh, will it uh, recover the passwords once again for example if I go to configuration mode and type no service password encryption you can see that by checking the password command that actual password is not decrypted it is still encrypted but if I want to define a new password that's not going to be encrypted once again so this is a good type of commands but this is not too good this is not good enough of course not too good this is not good enough because as I told you this is reversible what I want to do is to make sure that my password is never reversible so I just type for example enable instead of password I use secret secret is password but uh, when you specify this keyword whatever you type in is going to be encrypted with a uh, better algorithm so you make sure that that password is going to be so hard it says the enable secret you have chosen is the same as you have for enable password uh, what I'm going to do is to remove the uh, enable password so I just type no enable password and hit enter now I'm going to have enable secret this time it is not going to complain now if I show the running config and try to uh, figure out what the password is include secret you can see that it is already encrypted and the encryption algorithm is very very uh, strong I cannot recover this password anymore this is very very important okay if I go to user mode and try to go to enable mode I am required to type in a password and that password cannot be recovered if I don't know that the only way to recover that is to you know delete the configuration and write it once again and reboot a router 
Okay, we have multiple passwords for different uh, parts of the uh, router. So what I'm going to do right now is to make sure that I can connect to this router from uh, a line VTY, that means the virtual lines that I use, uh, for example, using SSH or Telnet. How can I do that? First of all, I want to go to router 2 and try to Telnet 1111 and hit enter. It says password required but not set. So this means that actually I need to have a username and a password on this router. Or I should go to line VTY and uh, type in a password. Right now if I show running config for line VTY you can see that there is no password here but it asks me to enter password to be able to log in. This login command means that you need to authenticate. You need to have a username and a password. But I haven't uh, anything defined in router one. So either I should go to configuration mode and go to line VTY 0 to 10 for example and type a secret or a password of course type in a password or I should def define a username and a password for this router. First of all let's try this. I type password Cisco or better to say password. This is a much better password. So hit enter. Now there is a password here. If I go to router 2 and try to tell net router 1 once again this time it doesn't ask me for a username, but it asks me for a password. Now I type password and I can log into router 1. Now this time if I try to go to enable mode, again another password is uh, required. What password should I type here? The password for enable. The password for enable was Cisco, so I hit enter and I go to privilege mode. You can see that there are different phases that I am required for password. First of all, the password to be able to use the line VTY and the second one, the password that I'm required to enter for going, the, going to privilege mode. Now let's go back to router one. I'm going to remove this password. No password, password. Uh, what I'm going to do is to go to global configuration mode and define a username and password. The username is for example Cisco and password or secret, secret is a better option, you know why, uh, is Cisco and hit enter. This time you see that I do not have any password underlined but I have a username and a password defined on my router. This is a good way to have a local username and password database. So let's go to router 1. I'm going to exit uh, and, and exit. Now I am on router 2 of course. So I'm going to try to telnet router 1 once again. This time it says password required but not set. Let's go to router 1 once again. The configuration on router 1 says to show running config line VTY uh, begin from line VTY of course. The configuration says login and for line VTY 0 to 4 it says again login. This means that the password should be set under line VTY. What if I want to use the local database that I just created one username and password under that. For this I need to go to line VTY 0 to 10 for example and instead of login I type no login but login local. This means that use local database. Now that I have typed this and I have a username and database, at least one username and database in my uh, password in my database, so let's go to router 2. This time the connection is going to be successful. This time it asks me for a username and password. So you saw different ways of creating 
uh, or hardening your radar. One, using a password under the line or console and make sure that login is enabled for that line. Two, to create a local username and database, username and password database, I'm sorry, I just keep, uh, keep you know, uh, making mistakes, a username and password database and make sure that username and password is used for logging into that router using uh, login local this time. Local means local database. Of course, there are other ways and that's using a server for authentication. And that is what I am going to talk about in next section. In previous section, I showed you how you can create a local username and password database on one router. And I assume that whenever you want to create usernames and passwords for a device, a Cisco device for example, you need to go and uh, type every command on that device. What if you want to have this username and password on all of the routers? What if you want to have multiple usernames and passwords on every router? So that's going to be a little hard to maintain. What you need to do is to make sure that you only need to have uh, usernames and passwords in one repository and whenever you want to edit those usernames and passwords you do not need to go to all routers or other devices to change them. You just change it in one place that becomes a standard server and there are two types of server for this purpose one of them is a standard one that is called remote um, remote access dialing user service that is called uh, radius imprint and another one is TACX that is for Cisco the second one TechX Plus, of course, is the newer version. This one is for Cisco, so not every vendor uh, Im Im implements that in its own uh, devices, but this one, Radius, is a standard. You can make sure that every device supports Radius. So this means that if I want to provide my credential to this router, for example, router 3, router 3 is not going to uh, check my credentials against its own database it sends the username and password to a server that is for example in this part of the network and connected to this router this server is a radius server if radius server uh, confirms or validates the username and password that's going to be okay I can log into this router and make any changes that I want to but if this radius server does not accept this uh, credential router 3 is not going to let me in and I cannot make any changes. So this is the essence of what we are going to do. This is a new model of authentication, hence the command AAA new model. And what we are talking about here is AAA. This service, TechX and Radius, both of them, so, you know, provide us with authentication, authorization, and accounting. Authentication means that I provide my credentials, username and password to a device and that device is going to let me in because my username and password is valid. The second one, authorization, means that I am already authenticated. Now I am going to uh, provide my permissions, any privileges that I have, to use it. Uh, to use a resource on this device. For example, if it is a router, I want to uh, show that I have enough permission to to make some changes, to see the result of some command, to uh, to you know shut down or you know turn on uh, an interface. Whatever I want to do, I need to have authorization for that. So first of all, it is authentication and then authorization. This third one, accounting. Uh, keeps track of how many bytes I have sent and how many bytes I have received uh, for billing or you know charging based on the amount of service that I have used. This is kind of old, you know. At this time, we do not use it for billing users. We use this mostly for checking the baselines, the usage of our network, and you know checking to see how much uh, data I have used so that I am adjusted to my needs. 
so we have this Tripoli. How can we configure our routers to use a radius server for uh, authentication and authorization? This is what I am going to uh, give you an example right now. So let's go to one of the routers, router one. What I'm going to do is to configure router one with the radius server. So first of all, I need to make sure that the new model is enabled because by default it is not. You type triple A and then new model. This command enables the new model that means usage of radius or TechX server. So after that, you need to provide uh, information about the radius server. This router needs to authenticate to radio server and then when it's uh, authenticated, it can authenticate other users. So this router needs to, uh, needs to show the radio server that it is a trusted domain. So how can I do this? Uh, type AAA and you can see that there is a server configuration and there is a radius configuration. Let me find that radius configuration. That is the group. Yes, that's it. Group and then we have server and then we have radius or techx. What I'm going to use is radius. So after that I need to I have a name for this group of servers. For example I type radius and next thing hit enter. You can see that I am under radius server configuration, the server group configuration actually. And the first thing it asks me is to uh, provide the radius server. The first one is a server. So I type server and there is an IP address for the server that I need to provide. The IP address of the server can be for example 111.212. And next thing it says uh, what is the accounting port? I can hit enter and the accounting port is going to be 1646 by default and 1645 by default is the authentication port and I can accept the defaults. So I hit enter and that's it. Now the next uh, thing that I'm going to have is to, to enter some commands about authorization and accounting if I want to. Uh, the only thing that I want to is to have this authentication and accounting port that I default define this right here. So let's exit. Uh, the syntax is a little different from what you see in version 12. In version 12 you do not go under uh, such uh, context to define the servers. But here it is a little different. And of course you have a command that says the radius server and the radius server has a uh, host keyword here that says the IP address of the server is for example 111212 and next thing it asks me about accounting port as I told you the default is 1646 and the authorization point is 1645. This is exactly the same as what you see in version 12. So you see that there are two different types of entering radio server groups. I type this and if I go to privilege mode, what I'm going to do is to show radius uh, server group and I'm going to use all. You can see that it says there is a radius, uh, there is a server group that says it is radius. Uh, its name is radius. Uh, there is one server here. The ports are defined. I can see another server group radius here and you can see the same configuration for that. So you can see that uh, both way define a server group but this way you can have a name for what you are defining. So here we have radius server host and we do not have anything to uh, specify the group but the previous type specifies the group. So let me show the running config for what we have here section radius hit enter and you can see that this is one type of defining radius server and this one is another so okay so let's go to configuration mode again configuration mode and in configuration mode I'm going to use this radius group how can I do that first of all I type AAA authentication 
Okay, what type of authentication I'm talking about? Am I going to authenticate you when you want to go to enable mode? Then I will type enable. Am I going to authenticate you when you want to connect from a remote host, such as using a telnet or SSH? Then I would go for login. Am I authenticating your point-to-point -point connection? Then I would go with PPP. So we can use this for different purposes. And of course, that one x This is a very nice example of using uh, authentication whenever you want to connect to a switch using wireless. That's going to be using um, radio server. That's a very nice example. I'm going to uh, use this for login. And this means that if I want to connect remotely to this device, I need to provide some username and password. So next thing, it asks me, uh, do you want to use this, what, what you are right now, what you are defining right now for the whole um, operations of this router? Or are you going to use this only for a specific purpose? If you want to use it for a specific purpose, you you just need to specify a name what i'm going to do is specify a name because i'm just using this for remote connection i'm not using this for point-to-point -point connection i'm not using this for console or anything else i'm just using this for remote connection so AAA authentication login the name is login this is a profile that i'm just creating now how am i going to use this what i'm going to do is to use a group and the group name that I use is radius you know that I have two different groups when I define it when I was defining uh, my radius server one of them had a name as I told you this is the new syntax and this is the best syntax because you can have multiple radius servers in multiple groups using this syntax you can create different groups but this one this is the old syntax this puts every uh, radius server in just one group and the name of that group is simply radius I'm not using this I'm using this one and of course I'm going to remove this command later so the group name was radius this is the great group that I just defined here so rather is going to use this groups uh, servers in this group to authenticate now if I press question mark something interesting happens it again gives us the uh, the list the previous list to, to choose from uh, I, what I'm going to do is to say that if radio servers are not available I need to fall back to another method such as the local database or such as local case database local case is the same as local uh, the only difference is everything is case sensitive you can see it says use case sensitive usernames uh, but if you use local only the passwords are going to be case sensitive uh, so what I'm going to do is to use local so if radio servers are not available I will go and fall back to my local database if radio servers are available I'm going to use them so this is just a fallback method so because um, there may be a lot of reasons that at times you cannot reach your radio server. Uh, a problem in network, a problem in radio servers. You know that radio servers these days are installed as a virtual machine on a virtual machine server. So sometimes the virtual machine is not um, reachable. So you need to make sure that there is a fallback method. And in this case, I'm using local. And I hit enter. This is a profile. So let me interpret this profile once again. I am using this profile for AAA authentication. What I am going to do is to check my database against the login request from a remote house. And the profile name is going to be login. I am using a group of servers. The group of servers name was radius. I just named it radius. You can have any other name. And you know that under this group, there is one server defined. And if these servers are not available, any of them, I will go for local database. Right now, I do not have any local database. Let me create one. So I just type username uh, admin1 password 
is Cisco. And of course, as I told you, you better use secret instead of password. So let's go for the best practice. Why use password? Secret is going to be Cisco. That's it. This is one username and password in my local database. I can define a lot of them. Only one is enough right now. Now, what I need to do is to make sure that any user connecting to this router from a remote host is going to be authenticated using this profile that I just created. The profile name was login. So I go to line vty 0 to, for example, 10. Hit enter and I just type login and after that what I'm going to do is to specify this name login the profile name and hit enter login uh, authentication of course after that I should have authentication and hit enter so login authentication is login that's it now that I have set everything up let's check the configuration once again show writing config for section line VTY says that uh, for line VTY I have enabled authentication using this profile and of course I have local database now that everything is all set what I'm going to do is to test my configuration and for this I'm going to make sure that I see authentication messages so I type debug AAA authentication and here we go so if I go to router 2 I'm going to tell it router 1 uh, 10 10 12 1 and if I hit enter it goes for username and password if I go to router 1 it says AAA bind IF and then next thing it says the login method was taken so this is the method that I'm going to be uh, checked against so if I go to router 2 and type the username the username was admin1 and the password was Cisco and hit enter I'm going to be logged in if I go back to router 1 I can see that it says radio server was not available so it failed it, it, it uh, fell back to to the local database and this, based on that local database I was logged in. I can exit and that's it. In this section I'm going to talk about different privilege levels and by privilege levels I mean the permissions to execute different commands on Cisco IOS. Whether it is a router or a switch you need some permission to execute a command and to execute that command if you are not administrator you are going to be given that permission by an administrator let me see how this happens if I go to one of the routers such as router 1 first of all you can see that there is a command here that says show privilege and it tells me my privilege level is 15 I am assigned a uh, highest privilege levels available on Cisco IOS. By this privilege level I can execute any command. This command can be a debug command, a show command, or a configuration command. It doesn't matter which one. I can execute all of that because I am assigned the highest level of privileges. So you can see that the lowest level is going to be 1, the highest level is going to be 15, and between these you can assign an administrator or a power user at different privilege levels and different privilege levels have different permissions not all of them can execute all commands on your Cisco router so first of all let's see why did I go straight to the privilege mode this mode is called privilege mode or exec mode or enable mode you can see these names in different contexts as you can see uh, when I uh, connect your console I directly go to this mode there is a reason for that if I type show running config for beginning from line console one zero you can see there is a command here that says privilege level is 15 whenever you connect to this line privilege level is going to be assigned as 15 this means that anybody who connects the console is going to be an administrator 
This is not a good practice. Uh, some person may get access to your router physically and when he or she logs into your router, she's going to be given this privilege level and uh, she's going to be able to do anything she wishes. So what I'm going to do first of all is going to remove this command and see the action. So if I type configuration terminal and this is another example of typing a command and receiving the permission to execute that because this is a command as you can see uh, this command just changes the context for me and as I told you I can execute this command because I am assigned this privilege level that has uh, enough permission to execute this so let's go to line console 0 and again because I have permission to do this I go to this uh, sub configuration mode and I type no privilege level 15 okay I'm going to do the same thing for auxiliary line and you can see that uh, all brothers of course do not have this kind of line and I'm going to execute this and I'm going to end and if I type exit you see that this is the first page when you when you connect to a router you see this page if you click on and press enter you can see that the user mode is enabled for me now if I type enable once again you can see that again I go to privilege mode directly because there is no password set for enable and if I try to execute show privilege uh, you can see that again I am assigned level 15 so once again if you haven't set any password if somebody connects to your router and types enable he or she is going to be assigned privilege level 15 now what I'm going to do is change this I'm going to change this and I'm going to enable AAA to control this I'm going to define different usernames and password I'm not going to use a radio server what I'm going to use is a local database in this local database I'm going to define different usernames and passwords one of them is going to have privilege level 15 that's me uh, another one is going to have a privilege level 11 for example another one a privilege level 7 another one a privilege level 5 and uh, in next section I'm going to give them the ability to do different to execute different commands first of all I'm going to save anything I have done until now, so far and I go to configuration mode let me clear the screen and start by defining the usernames so I type username admin 15 or better to call it yes admin 15 that's a better name I'm going to assign privilege level of 15 and the password or secret better to use secret is Cisco hit enter another one is going to be admin 11 and the privilege level is going to be 11 and another one let's have a privilege level 7 the name is going to be admin 7 and let's have a privilege level 5 so I type this username right now you can see that I have four usernames this first one is so crucial because if you do not uh, create this you are not going to be able to do anything else after you looked off your router so I created the two usernames and passwords the first one is mine now I'm going to enable AAA I type AAA new model and next thing what I'm going to do is to make sure that anybody who logs into this router is going to be authenticated against this local database so I use AAA authentication and I have different options one of the options is login it says set authentication list for login so I use login and and you can see that I can define a profile for myself or I can use the default profile I'm going to default define a profile so this is going to be login profile 
and uh, you can see that I can use different methods. I'm going to use local and hit enter. Now with this I will be able to authenticate a user. Now what I'm going to do is to make sure that after authentication a user is going to be assigned a privilege level based on the username and password. For that I need to make sure that authorization is enabled. And because I am authorizing a user uh, that is connected to a console, the first command that I'm going to type is this, AAA authorization console, and hit enter. Now, I can make sure that whatever profile I am defining here, I can use it under console line. So let's go and define an authorization profile here. So I type AAA authorization and next thing it says what are you going to use this authorization for I'm going to use this for going to exec mode so whoever logs into exec mode or enable mode is going to be uh, checked against the local database and uh, checked against the privilege level that is assigned to him so I type exec and right now it asks me if I want to define a profile or if I'm going to use the default profile. I'm going to use exec profile as the name. And for this, I'm going to again use local database and hit enter. This is the command that I just created. Now I can use different methods again for um, authorization as I told you authorization comes after authentication so we first authenticate the user and after that we are going to authorize the user to be able to use different commands and we do this based on the privilege level that we assign to that user and I'm going to show you in next section that we can assign different commands for those privilege levels but right now I just uh, go with whatever is the default on Cisco iOS so let's go to line console 0, line con 0 of course, and hit enter. Um, just use login authentication and yes, we have a profile for that. Let me see that. We have login profile and hit enter. And as I told you, after authentication comes the authorization. So for this I need to type a command and that says authorization. And because we are going to authorize against exec mode, I type exec and the name is going to be exec profile and hit enter. If I want to make sure that anybody who connects to virtual lines, the VTY lines, is going to be authenticated and authorized, what I'm going to do is to define such profiles for that. But right now, I'm just going with console. So let's see what happens. Uh, before doing anything, I want to check the running config. Show running config. And I'm going to include anything that has AAA inside. You can see that we define AAA new model. After that, we define a profile for console login. And also, we make sure that AAA authorization console is enabled so that we can authorize anybody who connects the console. Next, we have AAA authorization exec. There is a profile that uses local database. And finally, we have running config for section line con zero. So you can see that here we have authentication using login authentication and the profile that we define. And also we have authorization using the profile that we define. So let's see what happens when we use this. I'm going to save everything. I'm going to exit. Okay. Now I try to connect. As you can see, it asks me for a username because we enabled the login command on their console. 
So I type admin5. Hit enter. Password is going to be Cisco. And I go to privilege level. So what is my privilege? So if I type show privilege, it says your current privilege level is 5. If I try to go to configuration mode, it says this command does not exist. Actually, this command exists, but level 5 does not have enough uh, permission to do this. What if I want to show IP interfaces in brief? It says you can see that. What if I want to debug IP packet? You can see that it says you cannot use debug. And actually, you cannot use debug because I can see this caret sign under debug. This tells me that there is no debug command here. Actually, it exists, but again, I am not authorized to use that. So let's exit and try to connect using another username, such as admin11 and password for admin11. If I show privilege, it says the privilege level is 11. Uh, what if I want to debug IP packet? It says you cannot debug. What if I want to go to configuration mode? It says you cannot go to configuration mode. So let's exit. Now what I'm going to use is to use another username, admin15. And the password is going to be Cisco. What is the privilege level right now? The privilege level is 15. So basically, I can do anything I wish. If I go to configuration terminal, I can. If I go to interface level configuration, I can. And I can do whatever I wish. So let's save everything and make sure that everything is in configuration. Now that I have defined different usernames with different privilege levels, I'm going to assign some commands to those admins. Let's do this. First of all, I'm going to log in using my own username, admin15, and the password is going to be Cisco. Now I can go to configuration mode. Let me clear the screen so that I can start from the beginning. What I am going to do is to let them to execute different commands. And you can see that I have different levels of execution. You can see a lot of commands are here. So what you need to do is to make sure that you are assigning the correct command to the correct, uh, to the correct administrator. So what I'm going to use, first of all, is the exec mode. You can see it says the exec mode here. So let's press Control C and then type exec. In exec mode, I'm going to let them to go into configuration mode. This means that they need to be able to type configure terminal. So I'm going to give this to level 11. Level 11 can go to configuration mode. And so it says type in the command. I'm typing the complete command configure terminal. I'm going to explore to see if somebody, you know, uh, uses the a uh, brief form of this command, How what happens? So I hit enter. I'm going to let him to debug IP. And when I'm typing, talking about debug IP, this means that anything under debug IP is going to be uh, debugged. This means debug IP ICMP, debug IP packet, debug IP whatever. Whatever it is, uh, it is under debug IP. So we can see that we have different levels of command. The first one is debug. Next thing is IP. IP is part of debug. And anything part, in, part of IP is going to come after that. So I hit enter. I'm going to let him to check the uh, different sections of running config. So what I'm going to let him is to be able to show running config and hit enter. Now what I'm going to let him is to be able to change some configuration under interface and I'm going to let him to change IP address. So let's do this. First of all, I go for level 11 and I'm going to let him to type interface 
if I let him to type interface, he will be type the input interface and the name of the interface and go to the sub configuration of that interface. And under that, I uh, can see that it says interface is unknown command. So let me see. Interface is not under exec. It should be under configuration mode. Let me see the configuration command. What is the configuration command? That's it. The configure command. So I type privilege and instead of exec I type configure and now for level 11 I'm going to let him to type interface and under interface when he is under interface he can type IP address and uh, he can be able to uh, he's able to assign IP address to this user and I can assign a lot of other uh, sub to him. You can see that I'm just assigning IP address. If I assigned him IP, he would be able to uh, configure whatever is under IP, but I'm assigning only IP address. Okay, let me save the configuration and to make sure that everything's saved to GNS3, I just go here and press this button, save project, and project is saved to the system. Let's exit and now I'm going to use admin 11 and I type the password and right now I am able to do a series of commands. The first one was to go to configuration mode so I just type conf d. It takes me to the configuration mode and you can see that I can use the brief type of command. Now let's see what I have. These are all commands that I can use. First of all, one of them is interface. So I just type interface and you can see that I can go to different interfaces configuration. For example, fast01. And now let's see what I have here. The only thing here is a little, uh, you know, a few commands are here. I cannot use uh, even IP. So there is something wrong with the IP address command. Let me see. If I go back and check what I have assigned to him, you can see that under privilege I have given him IP address. Yes, no, no. Under configuration mode I have given him the IP address. And this is not the right thing because under configuration we have only IP and there is no IP at this command under configuration mode. I need to go and let him to use IP at this under interface level and this is why under interface level he doesn't see anything. So let's end, exit and go back using admin 15 that's gonna be me. Now I go to configuration mode and I type privilege and this time I'm going to check to see if there is something with interface, anything under interface, E, F, G, H, I, that's it, interface. You can see that it says the interface configuration mode should be uh, used using the interface command. So let's do this. Privilege interface. And I'm going to give this to level 11. And under 11, 11, I'm going to let him to change the IP address. I hit enter. This is the only thing that I'm going to let him do. So let's save everything. And once again, I want to make sure that everything is saved to GNS3 using this button. And let's go back. If I go to router 1 and exit and let admin 11 To log in using Cisco command, uh, he is able to go to configuration mode, he is able to go to interface mode, interface fast01, and he can change IP, and under IP the only thing that he's assigned is address. As I told you, if I didn't use IP address, anything under IP would be configurable for him, but the only thing that I let him is to go to IP and under IP go to address. So this is the only thing that he has. The IP address for example is 10 10 uh, 11 
one. And he could configure this, but you can see that he is not able to shut down or sh uh, no shut down this interface because he is not allowed to do that. So we can assign different commands to different administrators using the privilege command and just make sure that you are assigning the correct in com command under the correct uh, context. Interface context is for interface configuration, configure context for global configuration mode, exec context for privilege mode or enable mode or exec mode, whatever you name it. So these are the ways to assign different commands and, and make sure that your burden is less because you are uh, you are delegating your uh, privileges to different administrators. In this section I'm going to show you how you can use access class and that's kind of uh, implementing access less inside an interface but this time we are implementing that inside a VT line. So we use access class keyword like we use access group to implement an access list inside a normal interface. So I'm going to talk about access class and I'm going to show you how you can enable this under a VT line for this purpose. Router 2 here, it is going to be reached from router 1 only. I mean the enterprise network for telnet connections. No one from DMZ or internet is going to be able to reach to router 2 via telnet. So how can I do that? I need to go to router 2 first. What I'm going to do is to create a username and a password. So I type username. The username is going to be, for example, admin and password or secret better to use secret of course uh, is going to be Cisco and hit enter this is the username that we are going to use and we're going to make sure that this user can only connect to this network from inside the enterprise so what I need to do is to create an access list and because I'm just interested in the source of the connection and not the destination I'm going to use a standard access list. So its name is going to be allowed networks and hit enter. And what I am permitting is only 10, 10, 12, 0 and 0, 0, 0, 255. And of course I need to permit uh, 1, 1, 1, zero this is another network on router one so i make sure that both of these are allowed now i go to line vty and for line vty i use some of the port numbers and what i need to do is to type access class and this access class is going to use this access list and the access list name was allowed network and we have again inbound or outbound. I'm going to make sure that this is implemented inbound. And next thing, I want to make sure that login local is enabled so that the username and password inside the local database is going to be used for the authentication from router one. That's it. So let's go to router one. I want to log in first to router one. Now what I'm going to do is to telnet router 2. So I telnet router 2, 10, 10, 12, 2, and hit enter. Now you can see that I can telnet, and telnet is going to be successful. Now let's go to router 3, that is inside DMZ, and try to telnet, telnet 23, 2. You can see that the connection is refused because no one from router 3 is able to connect to router 2 because we limited the sources and the same happens on router 4 if I try to telnet 1 1 uh, 24 2 it is going to be refused and of course there is an access list on router 2 let me remove that access list show run interface serial 1 0 and you can see that there is an access list here. I'm going to remove this so that you 
make sure that this is not the reason. So I remove this. Now I'm going to remove IP inspection again. Now if I check the configuration interface serial 10, the only configuration is this. Now if I go to Rutherford and try to connect, again you can see that the connection is going to be refused because router 2 is only allowing connection from inter inside the enterprise. In previous section, I showed you how you can limit access to terminal from different devices. And I specifically used devices in enterprise to, to reach router 2's terminal, but the other devices from DMZ or internet were not able to do that. What I'm going to do is to make sure that different networks in enterprise network are going to be treated differently. I mean, for 10.10.12 and 111, if a user tries to access router 2's terminal from here, uh, he's not going to be allowed to fail more than two times to enter his password or her password. I mean, the third time that he or she um, fails to enter the correct password, uh, she's going to be you know, locked down for some specific period of time that I'm going to uh, you know, enter here. What I'm going to do is to allow another network to be able to reach to router 2. Again, this network is going to be inside enterprise and if an admin tries to reach to router 2 from that network, and I believe that my admin resides in that network, uh, he or she is going to be able to fail multiple times in entering his password or her password and router 2 is not going to complain but the other networks no router 2 is going to log everything for users who cannot enter their password correctly for the third time so let's go to router 2's configuration first i i, I want to show you that there is a network here the lookback 11 that i have just defined on router 1 this network is 111110 and 24 bit. So what I'm going to do to go to router 2, and first of all, I want to show the access list that I have. You can see that I have permitted this network to the access list so that users from that network are able to connect to my router. And if you remember from previous section, I added login to VTVI and it used my local database that I had uh, previously defined an, uh, a username in the name of admin. And you can see that this allowed networks, this is used here so that users from this, this networks are going to be able to access the terminal. Now we have some options for login. If you type login in global configuration, you can see that you can accept some delay, the delay between successive fail login. You can define what you're going to do if a failure happens. You can, again, do the same thing for success. You can enable quiet mode that in this mode, router is not going to complain to anything. I'm going to configure all of these for my section. So first of all, I want to say that if the login is a success, I can log uh, the success to, to, to a syslog server or to a buffer and later an admin can come and check to see who has been successfully logged into this router. Some of the administrators must be able to successfully log into this router, but if someone, a hacker that we do not know who he or she is, has been able to successfully connect to this router, we are going to uh, we are going to see that, uh, see into that. So here I'm going to look everything. For failure, but this is a little different. Failure is not that important, so I'm not going to look everything. I'm just looking every, let me, I'm looking every, every three times that he or she fails to uh, to log in. So if uh, she is um, failing to enter the password correctly for the third time, it is going to be locked. 
and whenever I as an admin come and see that failure I know that there is a problem with this specific administrator or the password or no this specific administrator is not an administrator it is maliciously trying to reach the router to this terminal so I just uh, used every three failure and I'm going to log once for every three failure now we have some others some other configuration here and the most important is block 4 this means that if a user fails to enter the correct password he or she is going to be blocked for some uh, period of time and this time period I'm going to block them for 90 seconds or here I'm going to block them for 4 or 5 seconds because I'm not going to waste so much time in capturing what I'm doing for you but you can increase it to 90 seconds or even you know 180 seconds this is your policy you should comply with your own policy so it says how many attempts I type attempts and after that I say if three attempts are not successful and it says three attempts within how much time I just type three attempts within 30 seconds for example and hit enter so if in 30 seconds the admin tries to enter her password three times and all of those three times are failed so she's going to be blocked for 45 seconds she's not going to be able to enter her password for 45 seconds this is the most important configuration here okay now as you remember I said that my admin resides in this network so the actual admin uh, whether he successfully logs in or fails to enter the correct password rather is not going to complain so I'm going to do this using an access list so let's write this first I say login and that's going to be quiet mode and for quiet mode I need an access class and again this is going to be an access list that I'm going to write it and the name is going to be admin network and that's it hit enter now let's create the access list access list admin network and that's going to be on a standard access list and it's going to permit 11 11 11 0 and hit enter that's it now what I'm going to do is to check my configuration so let's go to router 1 I'm going to end I'm going to write memory everything then I'm going to telnet 2222 and I'm going to use the source interface slash source of course the source interface is going to be loopback 11 so it tries to connect to router 2's console what if I want to do this 10 10 12 2 the same thing happens here this is not right it just doesn't feel right I need to check to see what is happening if I go to router 2 I want to make sure that access list is permitting this network and it is permitting this network and also there's another access list that says the admin network is allowed to connect but the quit mode is enabled for this so that's right so I should be able to connect to this rather let's remove this and see if we can connect yes we can connect and that's very odd that we cannot connect using the source interface of loopback 11 I guess that's because of routing problems so let's see what we have here I'm going to use admin or exit from here let's go to router one's console and say show run section routing and show IP 
protocol tells me that there is a EIGRP1. So let's see section routing EIGRP. That's it. Router EIGRP. Yes, that's the correct thing. So I guess correctly. Let's go to router EIGRP1 and I'm going to add network 11 11 11 11 0 0 0 0. That's it. Now if I and the configuration and go to telneting the other side using the source interface that's it now the username was admin now I'm going to enter the wrong username so I type admin1 and the password is Cisco one time it says username is incorrect admin2 Cisco again the second time that I'm entering this wrongly so admin3 I type Cisco you can see that again login is invalid and the connection is uh, closed so if I try to login once again you can see administrator can do that admin4 Cisco because I'm using the correct user source interface you can see that this is not locking me out it lets me to connect so let's use another thing, another user interface, such as another network, such as Loopback, or that's it, the network that is, yes, it says, you see that, it doesn't let me to connect, the connection is refused because of the username. Now, if I go back to Loopback 11, it lets me. So you see that uh, if I try to connect from the correct network it allows me to do that. Even if I you know um, enter the username or password wrong. But from other networks no I'm not allowed to do that. In one of my previous sections I talked about assigning different privilege levels to different administrators so that they can administer the routers efficiently. So we gave one of them the privilege level of 15. That was the highest privilege level that you can give to an administrator. Basically, a privilege level 15 administrator can do anything on this router, can configure any command. Um, I gave some privilege levels lower than 15, such as 11, 7, 5, and of course I had no control over the commands that they could execute. They could execute whatever the iOS lets them to do with that privilege level that they had. So what I'm going to do here is to change this a little bit. I may want to give an administrator some commands to execute regardless of what the privilege level is for that user. I mean I'm going to let him, I'm going to get rid of this one, uh, let me close this one. Okay, uh, so I'm going to let him to have a view. A view is a window of commands, I guess, and with that window of commands, uh, that administrator is able to execute some specific commands that I let him, I give him to do uh, within the context of that view. Uh, we can have a super view, of course, a combination of different views that mean a super view includes all the commands that those views can execute. So what I'm going to do is to show you what, um, uh, what, what is it like to configure these views. I'm going to configure an administrator that executes different shows and debugs. So he's going to be a debugger man. I'm going to let another administrator to be able to change everything inside an interface configuration mode. So that's going to be my interface man. And I'm going to have a super view that includes both of these, so that's going to be the supervisor of these two administrators. So let's do this here. On router 2, I'm going to do this. So let me clear this and go to configuration mode. First of all, you should know that the first step is to enable AAA. So I just type AAA new model. The second thing that is very important is to assign a password for the enable mode and why do I do this because when you are doing this actually you have a view already this view 
uh, contains every command, and that is the view that you have logged into. So first of all, I just type enable. I'm going to assign a secret or a password to that. Secret is more secure, so this is going to be Cisco, for example. And now I'm going to exit this mode and go to privilege mode. Now here, what I'm going to do is to go into root view. For this, I type enable, but after that, I'm going to type enable view, and because I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not pointing, I'm not mentioning any specific view name, so this is going to take me to the root view. So if I hit enter, it asks me for the password. This is the password that I just uh, had it, and I hit enter. Now you can see that it says successfully set to view root. Now I am the administrator, I am in the view root, that means I have ability to do everything. So let's go to configuration mode, and you can see that this is one of the commands that I have executed, configure terminal. So whenever I want to go to configuration mode, I need to be able to execute this command. This means that the root uh, level, the root view, has the ability to execute this command. Of course, a root view has the ability to execute any command. Now, what I'm going to do is to start defining the views. To define a view, you need to type parser view, and next thing, you need to assign a name for that. I have an interface admin, so I hit enter, and now you can see that I am in the context of uh, creating a view. It says this view is successfully created. Now I need to assign commands to that. First of all, you see that it asks me to assign a password for this view. This is very important. The first step is always to assign a password to this view. I assign a simple password to remember, but you need to assign a very, very uh, complex password. So next thing, I'm going to assign the commands here. First of all, I want to make sure that this view can enter the configuration mode because from there he is able to go to interface configuration mode. So first of all, I need to make sure that in exec mode he is able to execute this command. I'm going to include this command. After include, I need to type the command that is uh, that this view is going to be assigned. So it is going to be configure terminal. Okay. Next thing, he goes to configuration mode, so I need to go and assign this command for him. I just go here and type configure, because inside configuration mode, he can go and execute the interface command. So I type include, and it is going to be able to type interface, and after that, it's going to type interface name. Sometimes if you hit enter it says the interface not configured or present because I haven't mentioned any specific interface but if you want to be specific about the interface that this view is going to configure you can type the name. For example I'm going to have fast 0 0 and fast 0 1 and loopback 0. Okay? But if it complains, don't worry, this is not gonna uh, give you any error. So this command is enough to let the administrator to configure any interface on your system. So it goes inside the interface, so after that for command interface mode is going to be able to execute every command. And you can see that I have uh, assigned include all, every command that starts with IP and I hit enter. Now this is the commands that uh, interface admin can execute. Okay, now I'm going to exit this and I'm going to create another view. So I type parser view and the next one is going to be the debugger admin. And for this again I need to assign a password and this one is going to be able to execute all show commands. So I, I want to let him to execute any show command, whether it is the running config, whether it is different protocols, whatever. He's going to be able to execute any show command. So I type commands, and for this exec mode, I'm going to include 
all show commands. So I hit enter. And of course I'm going to execute, let him to execute all debug commands. So he should be able to undebug of course. And that's the next command that I let him execute. So that's it. Let's exit this and I'm going to create a super view. To create a super view it is easy. Just create a view parser view and the name is going to be supervisor and this supervisor is a super view so I type super view here and hit enter and again he is going to have a secret the secret is going to be this and next thing I type view and I assign debugger admin and I type view and I assign interface admin so this is the name of the view okay hit enter now supervisor has the ability to execute any command that debugger and interface admin can execute okay let's write everything to memory and now I'm going to exit exit and once again exit okay now I'm going to go to interface admin it says enable view interface admin of course so I type enable view interface admin now it asks me for the password of interface admin that's this and I go to see what commands I can execute right now you can see that I can execute configure terminal and I can execute all show commands and I'm not able to of course uh, execute the debug commands because I'm not uh, specifically assigned those so I just type configure terminal now you can see that I can go to interfaces I type interface fast 0 0 and I have the ability to execute everything that starts with IP IP and next thing every command is I'm able to do that so let's exit exit and exit once again now I'm going to enable this time I'm going to enable view uh, debugger admin and it asks me for the password this is the password now let's see what commands the debugger can execute it can execute show commands debug commands and undebug commands for example show IP interface brief that's it now let's exit this what I'm going to do this time is to enable view supervisor supervisor should be able to whatever these two can do so if I check the commands I can see that I can go to configuration mode I can debug I can show I can debug and debug so using views is a very nice way to enable different administrators to do their own job without interfering to others and other administrators job in this section I'm going to show you how you can use a class map a class map classifies the traffic this is a classifier as a matter of fact but you cannot use a classifier uh, alone you need to use this class map inside different uh, contexts such as a policy map or such as a zone based firewall you need to use a class map so let's write a class map and see this in action if I want to write a class map I start with this class map and you can see that I can assign a class map a name and I need to assign it a name a class map ha can have multiple statements if I want to uh, if I want to make sure that all of the statements return true I need to use match all if all of the statements return true then the class map is going to return true if uh, one of the entries only one of the entries or a few of the entries have to be true you need to use match any this means that any of the entries can be true and if only one of them returns true the class map is going to return true and finally we have type we can have different types of class map let me type this if I type type and press 
uh, enter after you know type in a question mark it says that we can have multiple types of class maps the important one is the inspect type that you can use it inside a zone based firewall a zone based firewall is a simple firewall yet it enables you to use rudder as a firewall and you do not have to pay uh, to buy uh, a, a sophisticated firewall because your network can be a small network and you do not need to invest that much to buy a sophisticated firewall so using a class map of type inspect gives you this ability to use this inside the zone based firewall and change your router uh, so that it inspects every packet that comes and goes uh, of course we can have different types of inspection one of the types that is uh, you know the best one is a zone based firewall that inspects everything the other type that is simpler and we do not go for that you know usually uh, that's gonna be nbar nbar as a um, network base I guess it's a network base application recognition or something like this I need to search for that uh, nbar is not so commonly used so you do not go for that but if, if you want to of course you can have that so let's go for a class map I'm going to use a simple class map I'm not going to use an inspector control or login class map what I'm going to need is to use uh, if, if I have multiple statements I need to make sure that I use match all or matching I'm going to use only one statement under this class map so I do not need to type that. And what I'm going to do is to match this class map with a traffic type such as telnet, such as pings, such as uh, FTPs or whatever traffic that I am going to classify. So let's type FTP for example and hit enter. You see that there is a sub configuration mode for a class map and you can see it says CMAP here. Now what can I do with this class map first of all I can match it with something so what am I going to match it matches different types of things first of all you can match it using an access group basically it says you can use an access list to match this again so if I have an access list an extended access list ideally uh, that matches with a certain type of traffic such as FTP I can use that access list inside this class map and this class map can you know match that traffic and then I can use this class map inside a policy map that uh, you know decides what it is going to do with that type of traffic so this is one of them the other one is match any any packet matches this one and you do not normally use this you can match a class map with another class map actually this means that you can nest a class map inside another class map inside another class map inside another class map so this is very nice feature so when you have multiple class maps and you want to use all of them in one context you need to go to you need to go with uh, nesting the other one COS you can use COS you can match with destination address you can uh, match with DSCP again this COS DSCP, different types of you know QoS uh, markings. I can match with a specific flow if I define a flow of course. I can make sure that the frame relay DE bit discard eligible bit is set. I can make sure that this is uh, a frame relay del C. I mean the PVC number. I can make sure if this traffic has a specific interface type I can use different IP values I can use MPLS uh, I can negate everything uh, and, and different types of you know matchings I can match with basically anything what I'm going to use is this one match protocol so if I use match protocol the first time that you use this it is going to take some time for you and you can see that a lot of traffic types a lot of protocol types are here what I'm going to use is to match to FTP so if I go up and try to find FTP if, if FTP is here I don't see FTP do you see that if I try to find FTP 
that's not here. So let's see if we can find TCP. Basically, FTP is a TCP traffic, and, and no, I don't see FTP here. So what I need to do for FTP, I need to use an access list that uh, that matches to FTP and then use it inside here. So let's go with something else such as TFTP, such as such as what? SNMP, such as you know uh, ICMP. So we can have different types of traffic and we can match with all of them. And what about IP? Let's me type IP. So if I type IP and after that check you can see that it says I'm matching uh, this with uh, basically IP, anything that falls under IP. Everything, of course, falls under IP. So this is how you uh, match your protocol here. What I'm going to use is ICMP. So I type ICMP and hit enter and you can see that the first time it is going to take some time because it is going to initiate this type of matching and when you wait for that it says uh, something happened a new adjacency that's because again uh, because of this because it is going to inspect everything and that's it now if I try to check to see what class maps I have here I just type do show class map and this is because I am in configuration mode uh, on this, uh, otherwise I need to use show class map. And you can see it says that there is a class map and the default is match all. This is very important to know, default is match all and the name is FTP. Of course this is not a descriptive name because I use the ICMP here. Uh, there is another class map that is by default there. Always it is there. Then make sure that you use this whenever you need that. The name is class default. This is very important to make sure that you are typing this in a lower case. Um, this is not capital any letter. So class default matches any. So whenever you use multiple class maps inside a policy map, you may go for the rest of the traffic that is not matched and that rest of traffic is uh, matched using class default. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm going to delete this class map. So I just go and type no class map FTP. Let's try to create this once again, but this time I'm going to use an access list. So I type IP access list uh, if extended FTP. And what I'm going to do is to permit. And I'm permitting because I'm going to match with this type of traffic. I'm not going to deny this. Permit uh, TCP from any source to any destination, and I'm going to make it equal to FTP, and of course, match to FTP data. So I have two uh, permits inside this access list. Now, I have multiple phrases inside this access list, but this is only one access list. So again, it doesn't matter if I use match all or match any. I just use match any as a change, that's it. So again as I told you I'm just matching with one statement so it doesn't really it doesn't really matter if you use match any or match all. So I type FTP and inside class map context I'm going to match I access group and it says what is the name of this access list its name was FTP and and hit enter it says invalid input detected match access group and after that I need to assign this name FTP that's it now let's see access list I have one access list and let's see class map So this is the easiest way to create a class map. I'm going to continue my discussion in the next section and show you more sophisticated class maps. In previous section I showed you how you can create a class map. 
let's check what we have here. Or rather to if I try show class maps, you can see that I have two class maps here. One of them is the one that I created. The other one is there by default. This default one, as I told you, is uh, match any. This means that any traffic that you are uh, you haven't matched, you can use this for matching. And of course I matched FTP traffic. I had two entries, one of them for port 20 and the other one for port 21. But you can see that this class maps has only one entry. As I told you, default is match all, but match any, I use it just to show you that match any can be used. If I had multiple entries, this would have a meaning, but right now it doesn't have a meaning because I only have one entry. So what I'm going to do right now is to go and use another class map. In this time I'm going to use match any and I'm going to show you I can match with different uh, traffic patterns. So let's create a class map. This class map I'm going to have match any for that and the name is downloads and hit enter. Okay, I assume that downloads are done using HTTP. And I am stopping specific types of downloads, such as uh, movies and music. So what I need to do is to match protocol. And you see a long list of protocols here. What I'm going to use is HTTP, but you can check the protocol for yourself and see which type is appropriate for your use. I type HTTP. And after that, I can have different attributes of HTTP pro pro protocol. I can have uh, header fields. I can have request types. I can have the server names. I can have the MIME types for different files. I can have a URL. What I'm using here is a URL. So I am checking the URLs of, uh, of what I am downloading. That URL. Uh, can contain anything, but at the end it finishes with dot the extension of the file. I assume that the video files have extension of API, and I am having a pipe here. This pipe means or. I assume that they are. Let me find the start on the keyboard uh, of type movie, and again I assume that they can be of type. Uh, MP4 and different formats you can add and, and continue this list and what I'm going to do you can see that the first time we have this the protocol is going to take some time it is going to take some long time sometimes now the next thing I'm going to do is to go for music different music um, types for example MP3 um, the other type of music that is come on is a uh, wave for example and that's it two types of music I am stopping these types of traffics and hit enter that's it now if I check my class map you can see that I have match any this means that if a traffic matches this line it's going to uh, you know classify as downloads if it matches the other line, one of the lines should be a match so that match any returns a true for this classification. So uh, you can see that of course inside this uh, this line I have multiple types of uh, traffic and I am using or inside this but this is a little different from what we have in match any because in any line I am specifying one entry and in one in that entry we can have of course uh, different matches but 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 you should know that I am only matching one type of traffic in any line and when I am using match any any of these can be true and return true in previous section I created class maps different types of class maps I showed you how you can create a class map and I told you that to use a class map mostly you use it under a policy map and a policy map can be applied to different contexts such as an interface. What I'm going to do is to show you what class maps I have defined and then I'm going to define a policy map to use those class maps. So first of all I wait for the router to come up 
to load and when load is complete let me clear the screen and type show class map and right now you can see that I have two class maps defined one of them uh, matches different types of downloads one of them is FTP I'm going to drop both of them I'm not going to let any type of these any of these types of traffic to go through the interfaces of router 2 I'm not going to let my enterprise uh, to you know use FTP or to use HTTP to download different types of files here but before applying them I'm going to check the reachability so I go to router 4 and first of all I want to type uh, telnet 10 10 12 1 and I'm going to use port 20 and it says connection refused by remote host this means that I can reach to router 1 but um, router 1 is uh, stopping the traffic that's okay this means that telnet is somehow successful so let's go to router 2 now I go to configuration mode and I start defining a policy map like class map a policy map can have different types if I type type here and and check the the options I can see that one of the most important types are, is inspect that is used for zone based firewall we can use it for login we can use it to control policy maps or different types of policy maps I'm just using the normal type of policy map so the only thing here is a name so the policy map is going to be black downloads and I use this for different types of downloads so you can see that I can define it as, uh, I can have a description to uh, to show the purpose of this uh, policy map I can use classes these classes are the class maps that I have defined and for each class I'm going to uh, define the the action I can rename the policy map this is a very nice thing because somehow the policies for naming your uh, objects change and you need to conform to those policies so what you need to do is to rename instead of deleting and creating once again because when you do that you are losing your time but when you rename the policy map you are not losing any time so what I'm going to do is to go to classes first the first class is FTP and you see that most of the options are related to QoS and QoS is going to be another course so right now I'm not going to define those but you can see that I can shape or policy traffic I can set priorities, set different options for QoS such as DSCP or COS values I can I can use a policy map inside the policy map this is exactly the same as using class maps inside class map this means that nesting is enabled for policy maps as well I can drop the traffic exactly what I'm going to do right now I can set bandwidth or I can set a lot of other options that you can see here what I'm going to do is to drop the traffic so FTP is going to be dropped uh, the other class is here downloads so I use class downloads and I'm going to drop this as well now uh, I'm going to show what I have here show policy map is a command to show the policy maps I have a policy map here two classes are defined both of them are going to be dropped so this is a policy map how can I use this I can use this inside interfaces uh, for interface again I can check my uh, topology and uh, decide which one is the best interface to apply this we can apply policy maps in different contexts now I am applying this to one of the interfaces and this is a good idea for blocking the traffic now which one is the best I guess this one the serial interface is the best one to block anything incoming so let's go to router 2 once again go into interface serial 1 0 I'm going to apply this using service policy and for service policy we have 
input, we have output, and again we can have type. Well, I'm not going to type about, talk about type. I'm going to have this input. As you can see again, this is going to apply for ingress traffic. Uh, next thing, the name of the policy map. And the name of the policy map was block downloads. So I do this and that's it. Hit enter. So let's check this again. If I go to router 4 and try to connect to router 1, this time you can see that the traffic does not reach router 1 because it is blocked on the way. It says connection timed out instead of saying connection refused by remote host. That uh, means that the traffic uh, reaches the router 1 but router 1 refuses. Here we can see that it doesn't even pass router 2. That is our firewall. So let's go to router 2 and what I'm going to do to ex is to execute this command once again to show policy map. This shows me the policy map and let's go to privilege mode because here I have more options to execute the show commands. What I'm going to type is here show interface serial 10. If I hit enter this gives me information about the interface itself but if I continue my command now you can see that I have different options. One of the options is gonna be about interface like this. Show show policy map and after that I am using interface that's it. I was looking for this. Uh, interface and the interface name is serial10 and hit enter. Now, by show policy map interface, I have a lot of information. One of the information is this. How many packets matched the, the FTP class map? How many packets matched downloads class map? What about class default? You can see that I have class default here. Let me try to ping 10, 10, 12, 1 with a repeat count of hundred you can see the ping is successful now I'm going to show you that if I execute this once again any other traffic that uh, didn't match these classes fall under class default and this is very important and there's something else the order of the class maps are so important because a uh, policy map is going to match the traffic with the first class then it goes to the second class if it isn't a match to the first class then to the third class if it isn't a match to the previous classes so order of operation is so important order of applying the classes are so important here uh, the order is not so important because these are completely different class maps but sometimes you have matches that you know starts starts to broaden so the narrow, the narrower, the, the yes, the narrower selection should come up in the order, and the wider selection goes down. And I'm going to talk about this in QoS section, um, in 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 details. In a previous section, I was talking about intercept mode as I told you in IP TCP intercept feature on routers uh, I said that the router is going to sit in between of the client and the server assuming that this is my server and this is my client here so when client tries to initiate the connection to the server it has to go through the router 2 router 2 does not let the TCP send message to to go to server, it 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 it's it responds to the clients and if client responds back, rather to knows that the client is trying to create a real connection, not a this is not a not an attack. So rather to would create a connection with server and then uh, server and client would start communicating happily without even knowing that there is a rather in between. So there is a second mode that is called a watch mode. I didn't talk about watch mode because 
this one actually is just monitoring the uh, decision creation. So how does this happen? Client sends the message to server. This time, router is not going to intercept the message. It just watches the message go and the response go back. And if client sends the response back to the client to the server, router will know that this is going to be a legal connection. Otherwise, it is going to send the reset message to to the server and server is going to reset the connection. It is not going to pursue the connection anymore. Now there is another feature that is quite similar to this one. It's called IP inspect. As you know, IP inspect is for CVAC. But with IP inspect we can inspect different things such as TCP connections and UDP connections. And you heard it right. I said UDP connection. You say UDP is connectionless? Yes, it is connectionless. But in this feature, CBEC assumes that if you respond a UDP request, it is kind of a connection. So it counts it as a as a as an active connection. So whenever it is counting the connection, uh, it counts TCPs and UDPs. Uh, in the same manner. So whether you have 50 UDP connections or 50 TCP connections or a combination of these two, it is going to count all of them and, and assume that the configuration is going to apply to all of those connections. Once again, if there is a reply to a UDP message, that is going to be assumed as a UDP connection in IP inspect feature. Okay, enough talking. Let's go for com configuration. I'm going to start my routers first. And let's go to configuration mode. First of all, I want to clear the screen. And I want to show you the watch mode configuration for IP TCP intercept. And for IP TCP intercept, there is a mode command. That, uh, that have two different that has two different modes. Watch is one of the modes. And when you are configuring watch mode, you should go for a watch timeout. How long the router is going to wait before the connection is complete? If in this time period the connection is not complete, it is going to send a reset message to the server, and the server is going to finish the connection. So the watch timeout. I say this is based on the run trip time between the server and client. You, uh, you, you, you know, check that run trip time, and based on that, you are going to configure some time. I just think that 15 seconds is enough. But again, check it and hit enter. Now this is only two line of configuration, nothing more. So that's it. This is the configuration. But let's go for the other configuration. What I'm going to do is to remove this line of command and I'm going to start IP inspection I'm showing you the feature that is somehow close to what we had in IP TCP intercept IP inspect and you can see that I can inspect TCP and UDP for TCP you can see that uh, again we have the same configurations for both of them we have maximum complete and one minute and under TCP again we have max incomplete and of course we have a fin wait time that is quite similar to 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 the timeout to watch timeout that we had in uh, IP inspect IP TCP intercept watch mode so this is one of the configuration here what I'm going to do is to type IP inspect and I'm going to configure this for both of them so max incomplete it has a low value. The low value can be any number. I'm going to assume that low value is going to be 16. The high value is going to be uh, 100, for example. And again, we have one minute. I, I allow 100 incomplete connection, but I'm not going to allow all of them in one minute. In one minute, I allow a maximum number of about 15 or something. So I type IP inspect and I'm going to type one minute and for one minute again we have as low as 10 
and as high as 15 and hit enter. So this is a configuration for IP TCP and again for maxing complete there is a very nice configuration under IP TCP IP inspect. Now let's see that. For TCP if I uh, want to configure maxing complete I can assume that a host can create up to 20 uh, incomplete connections and if this threshold reaches I'm going to block this host for about let me see is it in milliseconds or a minute it is in minute for about 10 minutes so this is what I have here now what is the meaning of this command it says if we have 20 incomplete uh, 20 incomplete TCP connections from only one host that's going to remove that host for about 10 minutes it is not going to let that host to connect to this server once again because it is assumed a spammer an attacker or something like that so what is the meaning of that you know that a lot of connections are created during a session for example when you are opening a web page based on the number of items inside that web page the scripts the images the uh, CSS files or a lot of other items that are inside an, uh, a web page you know for each one of them you're going to create a TCP connection you're going to receive that item and then you're going to close that connection so a lot of connections are created so 20 is a fair amount I guess you can increase it or you can decrease it and the block time of 10 minutes it is too punishing I guess it is too much uh, normally I go for two minutes or one minute even but here just for show I'm going to configure it about to uh, 10 minutes and one important config configuration again under TCP is scene wait time as you can see it says specify timeout for TCP connections after a scene and no further data again I'm going to configure it as 15 seconds and hit enter now this one is important I type IP inspect and after that we can have a name okay so I name it spe specify an inspection rule and after that I'm going to have a name for example inspect TCP UDP this is the name the next thing I have here is the connection type that I'm going to uh, check it as I told you I can have it for TCP and again I can have alert audio trail or whatever and I have UDP so all the configuration that we have uh, it is going to apply to this name and I can use this name under an interface so I go under interface serial 10 for example and I type IP inspect and the name is going to be this and it is going to be outbound and of course you need to apply uh, an, an inbound access list so that it stops every uh, everything so let's show the running config of interface serial 10 uh, you can see that I have this IP inspection here and I have this access group that denies any traffic inside so now that I have this let's go to router 1 and try to send the TCP connection to router 4 what I'm going to do is this is admin 15 this is Cisco I'm going to telnet 1 1 24 2 54 as you can see it reaches router 4 and of course because password is required and there is no password set on router 4 it is going to uh, be closed but you can see that it reaches router 4 what if router 4 tries to reach inside if uh, it tries to telnet 10 10 12 1 you can see that it never reaches router 1 because uh, router 2 is actively inspecting this and it doesn't let anything go through okay now let's go for some 
um, verification commands are rather too. If I go here, show IP inspect, and again we have the same configuration that we had. IP inspect all, you can see the configuration here. For example, DNS timeout, for example, uh, TCP alerts, for example, a lot of other information are here. You can check for them. And other commands that we had previously, such as show IP inspect, let me see, sessions. And hit it right now. There is no session. If I go to router one and try to telnet, and in the meantime, I check the sessions. No, there is no session because the connection is not created. Let's go to router 4 and try to assign uh, an enable password. Enable password is going to be Cisco and underline VTY 0 to 4. I'm going to have login. And now login is disabled. Let's have login local and have a username. Username is Cisco password is Cisco. And now if I go to router1 and try to tell that router4 username is Cisco, password is Cisco, now the connection is created. If I go to router2 it shows me a session. The TCP session is open. And if I try to exit this the connection is finished, so if I check it, there is no connection here. In this section, I'm going to start a discussion on TCP intercept. First of all, I want to give you a reminder, a refresher on TCP connections, and then I'm going to talk about a situation in which a, a, an attacker tries to uh, use all our resources and that's called a SYN attack. So I assume that there is a server in my network, this is an FTP server for example. There is a client on the other side, an internet, that tries to connect to my system and tries to download a file from my server. So the first thing is the client sends a request to my server because this is going to be a TCP connection the first phase is to send a synchronization request. So this is a SYN request from client to the server. And the server replies with an acknowledgement. And this acknowledgement means that uh, the client is acknowledged, the synchronization is done. So this is an acknowledgement message. And also, server should synchronize with the client. So it sends a synchronization message as well. The other side, that is the client, replies with an acknowledgement to the server, and that's an ACK message actually, and then the CP, TCP connection is created. So this phase has three messages, so it is called a three-way handshake. And shake, and my, my handwriting is shaking as well. So we have three-way handshake. The result of a three-way handshake is an established connection. You see, uh, you see the status as established for this kind of connection. We have some other messages as well. well. For example, we have reset messages that is called RST messages. We have fin messages that is the finish message, finish the connection. We have other types of messages, but these are the most important. So basically when a connection is created server um, gives some of the resources gives some of its resources to this connection perhaps a mem uh, an amount of memory a port number um, cpu process and any other resource that you can think of it should be allocated to this tcp connection so that the tcp connection is up and running so I assume that there is a problem and this problem is this the client sends its synchronization request and the server replies back the server has allocated the resources the port number the uh, memory or anything 
but the client never sends back the acknowledgement. So this is a half open uh, connection or what is called a uh, semi-established connection or something. I don't know the exact word for that, but I know that is half open connection. A half open connection never goes to established mode because the client is never sending the acknowledgement. So the server's resources is allocated to this connection, the connection that is not going to work. So assume that the client sends a lot of synchronization messages to the server and server uh, sends a lot of acknowledgements back to the client. So server is allocating almost all its resources to the connections that are half open. Now this is called a SAN attack. In this type of attack, uh, an attacker tries to deplete all the resources on the server. So the server is going to be unresponsive to any other client. The server cannot respond to the other requests. So how can we stop this? How can we make sure that we are not going to be a subject to a scene attack? One of the features that is implemented in Cisco routers is called TCP intercept. And in TCP intercept, what happens is this. Let me assume that my server is here. I'm going to make it a little thicker. And a client is here. So the client's normal path to reach to my server is going to pass router 2, and router 2 is going to send the request to server. Server is going to uh, send the replies back to router 2, and router 2 is going to forward it to the client. And this is, uh, this is where traffic comes and goes. So we can implement the feature on, on this router. The feature says, Whenever I receive a TCP synchronization request, a syn request from a client, that is this, and this is a server, a client, when, when a client tries to send a request, and this is a client and this is a server, client sends the request, a router 2, for example, here, sees the request. So router 2 does not forward the request to the server. Instead, router 2 is going to acknowledge the synchronization request and sends an acknowledgement and a send to the client. The client has already sent a synchronization message. So if the client uh, replies with the third message that is acknowledgement, then the router knows that this is a right, a rightful TCP connection. So Router is going to create a TCP connection to the server. So server replies and router replies. Router has a, um, a connection to the server. A router has a connection to the client. Client and server communicate without even knowing there is something in the middle of their connection. So the router is going to act as a proxy here. And it is transparent. So you know that this router here governs every TCP connection that is created between the server and client. And actually, router is creating the TCP connections. And, and if it feels that there is a problem with the connection, it is not even going to you know bother the server. So this is the feature. Now, in the next section, I'm going to talk about the commands to enable TCP intercept feature. Now let's talk about the configuration of TCP intercept. First of all, I need to define a list of servers. These servers are in DMZ area, so the IP address for those servers is 10.10.23.0/24. These are going to be protected by my router that is going to act as a firewall in between, router 2. So first of all, what I need to do is to create an access list that contain these lists of servers. These are going to be my destinations. The, the sources are in another part of the network, for example, internet. They are going to uh, establish a connection to the servers and I'm going to protect the servers. So let's go to router 2 and first of all I define an IP access list and its name is servers 
subnet and that's going to be an extended access list so I type ext here and I'm permitting because I am including any protocol I just type IP actually you know that this is going to uh, include on the TCP but I just typed IP because uh, this is inclusive it includes everything so uh, permit IP from any source to this subnet the subnet was 10 10 23 0 and that's going to be 0 0 0 at enter that's it uh, next thing I'm going to enable IP TCP so I exit and first of all I want to show you some options here if you type IP TCP you can see that we have a lot of options TCP intercept is what I what I am going to talk about so I just type IP TCP intercept and there are a list of items and some of them are a little vague and I'm going to talk about that First of all, you should know that the connection has a timeout, but this timeout uh, should be uh, small. You should not um, create a big timeout. This means that if you have a long timeout, the connection is going to wait for a long time before it is discarded. So what I'm going to do is to make sure that it is 10 seconds or 15 seconds based on the run trip time that I I, um, I I normally know about my network. I know that my connection is a little fast. I give the other side some time to reply, but if if it fails to reply or if it doesn't reply intentionally, I'm going to discard the connection. So I, I believe 15 seconds is uh, plenty. The next thing is maxing complete. How many incomplete connections? do I allow to be created normally I do not go higher than 100 I mean if there are more than 100 connections I'm going to drop some of them and I drop them randomly or I drop them uh, based on the uh, old to the new you see there is a drop mode here that says you can drop some connections randomly or you can drop the old ones first I prefer the old ones first so it says if you have a lot of incomplete connections or have open connections you are going to drop them so max incomplete says how many connections should be there so that you should you can you 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 start dropping them I assume 100 is plenty and there is something else here uh, one minute I say okay I will accept as much as 100 incomplete connections but I'm not expecting to receive all those incomplete connections in one minute if I receive a hundred incomplete connections in one minute or even more than that I believe that there is a sin attack I I guess there are about 20 incomplete connections or 10 incomplete connections in a minute acceptable more than that is not acceptable so max incomplete says the total number of half open connections but one minute says an average of this number should be created in one minute more than this I suspect there is something going wrong with my network so I need to configure both of these so first of all I type max incomplete the max incomplete uh, has a high number and then has a low number the high number says from this I'm starting clamping I start uh, dropping the current connections and I assume that this is about 100 okay but the low number uh, it says first of all you should uh, configure low number so let's go for low number first it says if uh, we have as low as 60 connections that are incomplete we are not going to drop anything that's okay for us to have uh, six of that let me see what is it x high is going to be hundred so if we have less than 60 incomplete connections we are not doing anything if we have more than 60 but less than 100 we are going to drop some random you know incomplete connections 
but if we have more than 100 we are going to drop all of them we are not going to let any one connection more than 100 100 is the highest threshold here okay so as I told you we need to configure for one minute as well because that's gonna be our average so I type one minute and for one minute again I have low and high I'm going to set low to 10 and set high to 15 for example I assume that uh, I have an average incomplete connection in ev every four seconds okay now the rest of the configuration again are important first of all you should say that this IPTCP uh, intercept feature is for these lists of servers so the list is going to be the access list and as I told you the list of servers name is servers subnet so I hit enter now I have configured IPTCP intercept for any connection that matches these uh, this access list and the next thing as I told you is connection timeout so I type connection timeout and you can see the connection timeout can be can be a long long time or as low as one second as I told you 15 seconds is okay for me and and the drop mode I can go for drop mode and as you can see the oldest and the random I'm going to use oldest because I believe the oldest ones are the worst ones okay now I am old of course and the world of TCP intercept is going to catch me <laughs> as soon as possible but right now uh, this is a configuration for TCP access list so let's go through the configuration let's show the running config and see what we have done we have uh, IP TCP intercept let me see what I have here we defined a list we change the connection timeout we change the TCP uh, intercept max incomplete when we configure the low and high threshold for that and also we configure that for one minute and and because the mode was oldest by default you don't see any command for um, selecting the oldest okay it's time to check this configuration so let's go to router 4 for example and try to tell net 10 10 23 3 on port 20 for example or even telnet because telnet is uh, a kind of a TCP connection and before that I need to go to router 2 and start a debug so I go here and first of all I want to save the configuration and then I'm going to start a debug debug IP TCP I believe there is something for this IP TCP intercept yes that's it and hit enter so let's go to router 4 and initiate the telnet now you can see that it goes to router 3 and there is going to be a username and a password let's go to router 2 and see what happens I had intercepted a new connection from 1124 uh, 254 you can see the same message sent to 101023 3 on port 23 and uh, this sent back an acknowledgement and a synchronization and this sent uh, synchronization now you can see the connection is established this is very nice the connection is established so there is nothing wrong with the connection after some time you see that the message reset is sent because rather for did not start the telnet connection because it didn't uh, it didn't you know enter a username and password in a timely manner it doesn't matter the telnet connection was created we saw the TCP connection here and everything was just fine in previous sections I talked about reflexive access list I showed you that reflexive access list can sit uh, in this interface that is uh, connected to the public network and uh, it is kind of a barrier it doesn't let any unsolicited traffic inside only the traffic that is a response to the 
outgoing traffic is going to come in. So this is very nice. And I showed you the mechanism. The mechanism was uh, this reflexive access list created dynamic entries for any traffic that goes out and let the traffic come in. And I told you that there are some drawbacks for a specific type of traffic. We cannot do this because uh, they use different ports, they use different incoming traffic, they may even use another path to come in. So we cannot use reflexive access list for all those traffics. But there is a very nice feature that is called context-based access list or CBAC. This gives us a lot of abilities. This is uh, perhaps the advanced version of reflexive access list. Again, the mechanism is uh, like reflexive access list, but it is a little, uh, you know, it goes a little further. And with this, we inspect any traffic that goes out. We may even let some traffic come in. Uh, again, we need to enable this on a network that is untrusted. You see, this interface is the best place to implement that. I'm going to enable inspection here. This is going to be inspection rule. And I need to create an access list to stop any other traffic. You know, any traffic is going to be denied. But in the meantime, context-based access list is going to poke some holes through the uh, access list and let the outgoing traffic to receive its response. So this is how CBAC works. But I, I think it is better to show this in action because there are a lot of commands that need to be explained about this context-based access list. So let's go to configuration and router 2. First of all, I type IP inspect. This is the way that you start CBAC configuration. You have some options here. Some of them are more important than the others. Uh, the first thing is name. You create a rule here. And actually, I call it a profile for inspection, but you can call it a rule. This rule is going to be used under an interface, perhaps the interface that connects to the public network. And that's going to govern any policy. Uh, the next thing is alert of you know that anything that goes out and comes in is going to gives us an alert i can disable this alerts of course i can enable this alerts for particular traffics but not all but if you suspect that there is going to be a lot of alerts you better go and turn that off and just enable that for certain type of traffic if you want to have more information about the traffic that comes in, Audit Trail gives you a lot of information. The addresses, the accounting, anything about that flow is going to be uh, saved to a log and you can read it later. And again, we have Maxing Complete here. Uh, this is about interception of, for example, TCP connections that are incomplete or half open. I have a complete detailed example in my course. I refer you to watching that before coming to this. So let's start by defining some rules. I'm going to name this, for example, inspection profile. You may find a better name for this. So IP inspect, uh, I need to type name before that inspection profile. Next thing, you can see that I can inspect a lot of traffic types. A lot of protocols are here and the list is too long. What I'm going to use is to, um, is to inspect, for example, uh, FTP traffic. Mm -hmm. FTP traffic is a good, uh, good example here. So I just type FTP. And next thing it says, do you want to turn on alerts for that? You can type alerts and then on. Uh, do you want to have information about the traffic? So you can turn on audit trail. Do you want to configure timeout? You can use that. I don't want to configure timeout. I'm not going to uh, do anything. What I'm going to do is to, uh, it says inspection rule configuration fail. Name length exceeds 16 characters. Oh my God. How many characters did I use here? Let me change it. Inspect profile. 
that's a better name. It is less than 16 characters. Okay, next thing I want to check HTTP as well. I want to check Telnet as well, but for Telnet I need to have more information because I want to see who is Telnet in my computer, from which computer it is Telnet in, or from which device, of course, not only computers. So I just type audit trail and I am turning this on. Also, for Telnet, I'm going to enable alerts. So I type this. Now you can add more protocols. This is just an example of what I was doing. Now, next thing, I am um, I, I, my users inside my network are using DNS. So you know that DNS has some recursive uh, or or uh, the other type of query that I just don't remember that. Uh, you know they send information to the to the DNS server. This DNS server may be outside my network for some, some, you know, we, I don't have authorization for all names. So I need to send some information outside to receive the resolution for that. So for this, uh, that's iterative. I just remember that. Uh, so we have uh, recursive and iterative queries for DNS. I need to make sure that DNS is uh, included in my my profile so I just account for that and and we have a DNS uh, timeout I guess that's let me see what we have here we have uh, oh that's not going to be inside the profile that's a global configuration so I have a DNS timeout entry here. You can see that it can be as long as two billion to a million seconds. So what I'm going to do is to set it to 15 seconds, for example. 15 seconds is a good thing. So I wait for the DNS re replies in 15 seconds, and if I didn't receive anything, I'm going to stop it. So this is a DNS configuration. The next thing I want to have is to enable this under the interface. But first of all, let me see uh, what I have done. So I check IP inspect, include everything that has on IP inspecting that. And you see that I have uh, turned the alert on. I wanted to turn alert off for the rest of the traffic. So I just type alert off and that's it. Hit enter. Now everything is done. I need an access list that denies anything. I mean anything. So I type IP access list uh, that's going to be extended and I name it deny inbound inbound traffic and hit enter and I'm going to deny IP any any uh, like I said you need to make sure that some specific types of traffic are allowed for example a DNS or RIP or whatever you wish I had only one configuration for DNS and that was the configuration that inspects the reply but I need to permit the incoming traffic for DNS unless it is taking so long. So I just type permit UDP from any source to any destination and uh, equal to DNS. No, that's going to be port 520. And now I'm going to deny IP from any source to any destination. That's it. Now what I'm going to do is to apply this to the interface, interface serial 1, 0. I'm going to use this access group, access list as an access group here. And the name is deny inbound traffic, uh, inbound. And right now I'm going to use IP inspect. And the name of that is going to be inspect profile. And 
this one is going to be applied outbound. Now everything is done. So let's go to router 4 and try the configuration. First of all, I want to ping 10, 10, uh, for example, 12, 1. The ping is not successful. What if I want to do this from router 1? If I try to ping uh, 1, 1, 24, 254, and hit enter, this traffic does not go out as well. Because I didn't inspect ICMP. If I inspected ICMP in router 2, that would work. So let's add this. I'm going to add inspection for ICMP. So this is ICMP. I just added ISP inspect name inspect profile ICMP. Now let's go to router 1. If I try to ping, the ping is successful. But what if I go to router 4 and try to ping? Again, the ping is not successful because this is unsolicited traffic. But router 1 initiated the ping request from inside the network. Now, if I want to telnet from router 4 to router 1, again, it is not going to be successful. So let's see this. Telnet 10, 10, 12, 1. You can see that it doesn't go through the firewall. But if I want to do the reverse from inside to outside, telnet 1, 1, 24, 254, you, you see that the, the telnet was successful. Uh, the problem is the other side is not just uh, configured for telnet, but telnet was successful. So this is working just fine. Now let's go to router 2 and check some verification. If I go to router 2 and go to here, and you can see that the other trail is creating some information for us. That's very nice. That's very nice. So it means that it is working just fine. Show IP inspect. And let me see what I have here. If I want to have every information here, I just type all. And you can see this is going to be long information to read. It is not what I want to. First of all, let's check the configuration. Config. And you see the configuration here. It says that session audit trail is disabled, alert is disabled, and they are enabled for a specific type of traffic. Type of traffic. FTP alert off, audit trail off, HTTP alert off, audit trail off, telnet alert on, audit trail on, and ICMP alert off, audit trail off. So this line gives me some information about telnet. Um, I see these information from telnet just because of that. Now I can have more information. For example, sessions. This is again very nice. So let me see what sessions I have here. Right now there is no session. But if I try to start the ping, for example, I'm going to have a uh, uh, this, if the right thing can see that the session is working, the ICMP session is open, and it is going to stay open until the ping is done. Let me see when the ping is done. I'm just going to check that once again. Now it is done. You can see that the session is going to stay there, but not for long. I need to wait for that and that's it. You see that it timed out and it finished. So this is working just fine. Everything is configured and I'm going to give you more information about this later. Just save the configuration for the next section. In this section, I'm going to talk about a feature on Cisco routers that is similar to what we have on a Cisco switch as a span feature. So there is such feature on a Cisco router that is called write. Let me show you. First of all, let's talk about some theories. Write is called router IP traffic export. And as I told you, it is similar to what you have as a span or 
remote span. So on a span you have a switch. Uh, it has several VLANs or several interfaces and you are collecting information sent or received or sent and received on a VLAN or on an interface and uh, you collect that information and send it to a server. This server may be attached to this switch or there may be another switch in between. In this case you are configuring remote span. So let's talk about this. Uh, we collect information that are sent or received or sent or received. So we can have bidirectional or only inbound or only outbound traffic on a switch. But on a router this is a little different. If I have such configurations, for example this one it connects to internet or ISP and I have a server connected for this router to this router so that this server is going to analyze any traffic that comes or goes. Uh, the router is going to, you know, collect the information that is inbound or bidirectional. There is no outbound traffic only. Uh, this is on the contrary to remote span or span. So let's configure this. What I'm going to do is to configure this on router 2. First of all, I want to go to enable view so that I can go to my specific view. That is the root view. And you can see it's a successfully set to view root. Now I go to configuration mode. First of all, I should say what type of traffic I am interested to, uh, interested in, of course. And and you say that you are collecting information uh, about FTP traffic. That is a TCP. Uh, you can use HTTP traffic. You can go for a specific scripts. You can collect every information, but this is not wise, although I'm going to do that. You should specify particular types of traffic so that you do not have a lot of information to analyze. Right now, I'm going to create an IP access list. The list name is going to be right, and it is an extended IP access list. I can permit different types of traffic, but as I told you, I'm going to go with all IP traffic. As I told you, this is not wise. So let's go for IP traffic export command. First of all, you need to define a profile. For the profile, I name it right and hit enter. Now, I am under sub-configuration of IP traffic export. I have several commands to configure. First of all, I should say which interface I am collecting information from. Which MAC address is the destination? This one, you can collect it using an ARP command. You can say what type of outgoing traffic and what type of incoming traffic you are collecting. And if you specify bidirectional, this means that you are collecting incoming and outgoing. If you do not specify this, this means that you are collecting only incoming traffic. And that's it. These are the configuration we need to do. First of all, I uh, say that this is bidirectional. I am collecting any information sent and received. And the interface is going to be serial 10 because this one is connected to my public network and I am um, you know, suspected that there are attacks from public network. The next thing, as I told you, I'm going to specify what type of incoming traffic is going to be sampled. The access list, I'm going to use the access list right and for outgoing I'm going to do the same thing. So I just type outgoing outgoing. Uh, the MAC address of the destination. So I'm going to use the MAC address of router 1 and router 1 is going to be my server here. So let's go to router 2 and first of all execute this command. Show ARP. As you can see for this address that is for router 1 the MAC address is this. So I'm going to copy that and type MAC address and paste this. 
This is my destination. Okay, now I can sample the traffic or I can send all traffic. I'm going to sample it. So first of all I say for outgoing traffic I'm going to sample one in every hundred packets. For incoming traffic I'm doing the same thing because I do not want to have a lot of information. I'm just interested in one every hundred packets of information. That's it. This is a configuration that is done Right now, I'm going to test my configuration. Of course, I do not have a packet collector on the other side to check this, but I can just uh, refer to the verification command. So I just go here. Um, and from brother for I initiate a ping. Ping 10, 10, 12, 1. Now I'm sending about two or five hundred packets and repeat count is gonna be this. And after that I go to router two and check the commands. Let's finish this first. Okay, five hundred pings are sent to router one. Router two is on the way and the serial interface receives all those packets. So I type show IP traffic export and hit enter. Right now it says router IP traffic export parameters. There is no parameter here. Ah, I, I, I just configured router traffic export. So let's see if there is anything here. So for interface, I need to specify serial one zero and hit enter it says there is no parameter here so let's see we have running config section traffic and let's see we have this configured IP traffic export profile right and I guess I haven't enabled this under the interface okay so I forgot one thing I needed to go to serial 1.0 and I needed to enable this IP traffic export and I need to apply right here and hit enter. Now it says yes, right is activated on serial 1.0. I just forgot this, I apologize. So let's go to router 4 and initiate the ping once again. And now that the ping is working, router 2 is collecting every information about this pings. And that's it. Let's go to router 2 and check this. Show IP traffic export and hit enter. Now it says the monitored interface is serial 10. Export interface is serial 10. Destination MAC address is this one. It is by directional traffic and the outgoing export information you can see that we have about 500 packets and because we are sampling one in every 100 only five packets are sent this is very nice this is for output and you know that there is a response for every ping so we have 500 response so that's going to be five packets out of 500 packets sent to the destination. Okay, in previous section I created the first zone pair and every component of that zone pair for internet to DMZ. I and mean, I, I want to create the same thing for DMZ to internet. So for DMZ to internet, let's exit this first of all. I'm going to create a class map that matches all users inside DMZ. So first of all, let's create this IP access list and that's type of extended and the name is going to be DMZ users. As I told you, because the source is only important to you, you can use a standard access list, but here extended is very handy. Permit IP any any and hit enter. Now I need to create a class map. The class map is of type inspect 
and the name is going to be DMZ users and it matches an access group with the name of DMZ users uh, again I forgot to type name this one okay now the next thing I create a class map of type inspect and this class map uh, name is DMZ to internet okay now I don't use any specific type of traffic so when you do not use that it is not going to stop any you know it, it doesn't filter the traffic so I use this one so I just match with access group match again match, match the class map and the class map name is DMZ users. Okay. Now I did this. What I need to do is to create a policy map. A policy map of type inspect. And the name is going to be DMZ to internet. It uses this class DMZ to internet and it inspects the traffic. Okay. Hit enter. Let's go for the next one. We need to connect from DMZ to uh, Enterprise. Uh, we already have DMZ users. What I need to do is to make sure that the type of traffic for SQL Server is matched. So I type IP access list and this access list is extended. And the name is going to be SQL Server Traffic and I already have asked my administrators in database section and they told me that they are using port number 1433 and uh, the communication uh, uses TCP connections so I just match with this permit TCP from any source any destination and the port number is 1433 and hit enter now this is matched I need a class map for that class map type inspect and the name is going to be SQL server traffic it matches access group and the name of that access group is SQL server traffic okay now let's go for the main class map the class map that nests other class map type is inspect and the name is going to be uh, from DMZ to Enterprise Enterprise and enter under this I'm going to match with a class map that its name is DMZ users and match with a class map that its name is SQL Server Traffic and this is match all because I didn't use match any here and match all is the default now let's go for the policy map policy map uh, the type is again inspect and the name is going to be DMZ to enterprise and for class DMZ to enterprise I'm inspecting the traffic once again okay now I have DMZ to enterprise DMZ to internet internet to DMZ now what I need to do is to create two more I'm going to create enterprise to DMZ and enterprise to internet and these are very easy first of all IP access list extended enterprise users and permitting IP any to any A class map that matches this one type inspect and its name is enterprise users that matches access group enterprise users now I need to create another class map uh, the type is inspect and the name is enterprise to internet it matches 
class map and the name is enterprise users it doesn't match any type of traffic because all type of traffic are going to be allowed and uh, that's it now let's go for the policy map policy map and its name is enterprise to internet for class enterprise to internet I'm inspecting the traffic now next thing uh, I go for a class map with a name of enterprise to DMZ um, I just match with a class map that's name is enterprise users again all type of traffic is allowed so if I create a class map type inspect and the name can be enterprise to DMZ and I match with a class map that I just created enterprise to DMZ and I already did it, huh? So let's go for policy map. The policy map, I needed to create a policy map here. I forgot to do that. Policy map type inspect enterprise to DMZ. The class is enterprise to DMZ. And I am inspecting the traffic. Okay, everything is done, I guess. And you can tell that uh, I am over configuring, huh? Uh, I may be. A little over configure I, I may be a, a little you know using more than enough commands you can you know have less commands that what I have here but this is easier to remember because I am using a pattern and I am following that so let's see what we have here first of all I go to this mode show class map type inspect tells me what class maps I have Right now you can see that I have HTTP and FTP, I have internet users, SQL server traffic, enterprise users, and, and finally we have internet to DMZ, DMZ to internet, DMZ to enterprise, enterprise to DMZ, and enterprise to internet. These are the class maps that I have here. What about the policy maps here? Show policy map type inspect. I have five policy maps internet to DMZ, DMZ to internet, DMZ to enterprise, enterprise to DMZ and enterprise to internet. Now I need to configure the zone pairs. So let's go to configuration mode. I already configured one zone pair and that was here. Let me find that. Here is the first configuration. Yes, we have zone pair security internet to DMZ. So let's create the second one zone pair security and this one is dmz to internet and i guess that was dmz to internet wasn't it uh it was dmz to no it was internet to dmz so that's right dmz to internet source is gonna be dmz and destination is gonna be internet okay what I need to do is to use service policy command type as inspect and the name is DMZ to internet okay the next one zone pair DMZ to enterprise enterprise and again let's use enterprise for the destination and the service policy is going to be DMZ enterprise and hit enter next one the destination is going to be internet and the source is going to be enterprise So the name is going to be Enterprise to Internet. Let's do this and change the name a little bit and hit enter. And for the service policy, I need to use Enterprise to Internet. Next one, 
use as a destination of DMZ. And here I use DMZ for the name. And uh, service policy is going to be enterprise to DMZ. Hit enter. Now let's check what we have. Do show zone pair security. Hit enter. I have internet to DMZ that uses internet to DMZ service policy. DMZ to internet that uses DMZ to internet and check source zone and destination to make sure it's correct. DMZ to enterprise that uses DMZ to enterprise. Enterprise to internet and enterprise to DMZ. So everything is working just fine. Now the final configuration. Let's go to assign interfaces to the zones. Before that, I want to make sure that everything is working. So here let's go to router 1. And first ping 10, 10, oh no, 100, 100, 100, 100. Now you can see the ping is successful. This means that from inside to outside or from enterprise to internet, everything is working. If I go to router 4 and try to ping 10, 10, 12, 1, you can see the ping again successful because we let internet users to reach to inside. But now I'm going to assign the interfaces. So let's go to router 1 and first check another thing. Ping 10, 10, 23 or better to use this. 3, 3, 3, 3. It's working. And if I go to router 3 and try to ping 1, 1, 1, 1, it works just fine. Any type of traffic now is allowed. Now let's assign the interfaces to each zone. Interface fast 0, 0. Uh, it is a member of enterprise. Zone member security enterprise. Interface fast 0, 1 is part of DMZ and interface serial 10 is part of internet. Okay. In this section I'm going to start the discussion on Cisco zone based firewall. This is a feature that you can enable on your normal router. You do not need to have a special hardware for that. Uh, I mean, you do not need to buy a firewall. You do not need to have training for uh, security features on a firewall. You do not need to have maintenance for a firewall. All you need to have is a normal router that you already have in place. And you need to enable zone-based firewall on that. A little configuration is needed, but once you know the concepts, it is very, very easy. So let's talk about concepts. A zone-based firewall is kind of um, an inspection into what you have as an incoming or outgoing traffic. So you know CBAC, you already know what inspection means, so this is kind of a CBAC, but with extra features such as zones. Instead of um, checking the traffic in just one direction, like inspection does on CBAC, zone-based firewall checks the outgoing and incoming traffic between two different zones. And I already have zones in place. You know in this topology you can uh, differentiate between three different parts. You can say that I have a zone connected to one of the interfaces of router 2. This one is my enterprise. Everything here is trusted so I do not need to worry about the traffic that go comes and goes from this part. So this is my trusted zone, it is called Enterprise. I have a DMZ, part of the DMZ connects to my Enterprise. That safe part of the DMZ connects to Internet users. From Internet use DMZ servers. So this part is semi-trusted, it is not completely trusted. And, and part of my in topology is Internet. Internet is untrusted network. I do not know what is out there. I do not know what is the threats and dangers. I'm going to be cautious about that. So this one is my third zone. Each one of these zones have their own interfaces. They can have their own 
uh, sub-interfaces or physical interfaces, it doesn't matter. What I need to know is I'm allocating each one of these zones an interface at least. So you can see that my DMZ is connected to FAST01. As I told you, it can be a sub-interface as well. My enterprise is connected to FAST00. My internet is connected to my serial interface. Okay, now I can govern, I can manage the uh, traffic that goes between these pairs of zones. I mean pairs of zones, you know. I can govern the traffic that goes from DMZ to internet and vice versa. I can govern the traffic that goes from enterprise to DMZ and vice versa. And I can govern or manage the traffic coming and going from enterprise to internet and vice versa. So for each pair of zones, I need to have a policy. This policy uh, tells me what I'm going to do with this type of traffic that comes or goes to these specific zones, these pairs of zones. Now, in my scenario, I have three different zones. You know that. You can see that from my topology. Now, for the traffic that it sources from one of my zones and the destination is another zone, I need to have a policy. For example, the traffic that comes from internet and goes to DMZ. I mean the source of the traffic is internet and the destination of the traffic is DMZ. I'm not talking about the returning traffic because returning traffic is going to be inspected. So for example if I send the traffic from enterprise to internet I need to have uh, some kind of inspection so that the returning traffic can come in. But the rest of the traffic, no, I'm not going to let any traffic source from internet to my enterprise. So there is nothing defined for that. Right now, uh, the, first, uh, the first word is my source. The second word is my destination. So I need to create these zone pairs. Each zone pair uh, manages the traffic that initializes in the source and descends to destination. So for the traffic from internet to DMZ, I'm going to allow HTTP and FTP traffic because I have a web server in my DMZ. So users from internet need to reach to these servers. Uh, from DMZ to internet, because the personal in DMZ are going to reach to internet, I'm going to allow any traffic. And you know that the returning traffic is going to be governed with this zone pair policy. From DMZ to Enterprise, I have a database server in my Enterprise and web servers in my DMZ need to extract data from my database server. So they need to have uh, reachability to my database servers inside my Enterprise. And uh, from Enterprise to DMZ, I'm going to allow any traffic. Basically, my Enterprise is the trusted network so any traffic from this source is allowed to any destination from enterprise to internet again the same thing happens you can see that I have not defined any uh, any policy for internet to enterprise this means that I am NOT letting any traffic sourced from internet to any destination inside my enterprise so if you do not define a zone pair for that this means that the traffic is going to be dropped. This is very important to notice uh, that the traffic is going to be dropped because there is no policy for that. The default is going to drop the traffic. Okay, so let's see what I need for each zone pair. I need to have policy maps. So for internet to DMZ, I'm going to have a policy that allows HTTP and FTP. So for this, what I need to have is a class map to categorize HTTP or FTP traffic. Okay, this class map is going to be added to the policy map that allows HTTP and FTP from internet to DMZ. The rest of the traffic I'm going to drop that so I do not need to, you know, classify any other type of traffic they are going to be dropped by default. From DMZ to Internet, again this one is important because I am allowing any traffic. 
but I am inspecting that traffic. Why? Because I want to make sure that the returning traffic comes back. And also, if I just let the traffic pass, I cannot inspect it. So I need to have a class map for that. Why do I need a class map for that? Because if I use the default class that is called the class default, that you know that the class default, um, you know, contains any, anything, uh, any user, any source, any destination, whatever. Um, the class default cannot have inspection applied to that. So I need to create a class map for that. So I have a class map and I need to have DMZ users inside this class map. What about the DMZ to enterprise? Again, the same thing happens. Class map. I need a class map. And this class map is going to allow DMZ users. So I just define DMZ users. And later you can see that I am going to examine pass and I'm going to examine inspect to see which one is better. And from enterprise to DMZ, I'm allowing any traffic again. Once again, you should know that I need to have a uh, users defined because um, class default is not going to let any user uh, to be inspected. Here I need to have inspection, so I need a class map and I'm going to have any users for this. Any user. And for enterprise, to turn it the same thing again. Applies. I need to have class map for any user. Okay, we can save this and we can continue in the next section. Okay, let's go for the testing. From router 1, I need to make sure that I still can reach internet. That's possible. I want to make sure that I can reach the DMZ as well. That's possible. So let's go to DMZ. From DMZ, let's go here. I need to make sure that I can reach to Enterprise. But you can see that if I do this using a ping, the ping is not successful. And that's because we didn't let this type of traffic to go through. Uh, the type of traffic that is allowed is TCP port 1433. So I just try Telnet 1111 using port 1433. And you can see that it goes through because you see that it says connection refused. This means that I could make it to router 1 and router 1 replied and the reply make it back to me. That's okay. From router 3 that is in DMZ, I need to make sure that I can send any type of traffic to internet. And that's possible. So let's go to router 4 that is in internet. I should not be able to reach to enterprise. So let's do this using a ping. If I try 10, 10, 12, 1, you can see that it is not possible. Okay. The same thing should apply to DMZ. I cannot use ICMP traffic to reach to DMZ. And finally, we need to check to see that we can reach to DMZ. If I try ping 10, 10, 23, 3, the ping should not go because we didn't allow ICMP. We only allowed uh, HTTP and FTP. So let's do this one. If I try to telnet 10, 10, 23, 3 on port 80, it says the connection is refused. So this means that we made it to router 3 and the returning traffic made it to us. And if I check back the class maps, I can see that HTTP and FTP matches uh, either HTTP or FTP. And everything is working just fine. Now that you know about uh, zone-based firewall, let's go for the configuration. Based on the topology, I can recognize three different zones here. One of them is my enterprise, 
I know that the users inside enterprise should be able to reach TMZ and internet, but users from internet cannot reach enterprise because I'm not letting any remote access to users in internet to uh, to get access to the uh, servers or any other resources inside enterprise. For DMZ, I I have a server here, a web server that um, that gives uh, access to internet users, so the internet users can download files from FTP or uh, watch web page from HTTP servers uh, inside DMZ. Uh, these servers receive some information from the databases that are on database servers inside enterprise, so I need to make sure that from DMZ servers can access to database servers inside enterprise, but other type of communication is not allowed. And, and uh, from DMZ, users should be able to reach to internet. So this is the simple scenario here. Let's go for this. I have three different zones. Uh, each one of the interfaces is going to be allocated uh, to be assigned to these zones. Uh, you can see that interface fast 00 is in enterprise zone, fast 01 is in DMZ zone, and of course serial interfaces inside internet zone. And next thing, I need to have zone pairs. A zone pair, as I told you, has a source and a destination. If you define a zone pair for the source and a destination, the traffic is going to be allowed based on the policy that you define here. But if you do not have a zone pair for a specific source and a destination, traffic is going to be dropped for that. You can see that I have enterprise to internet, but I don't have any internet to enterprise. So this means that no traffic from enterprise internet can enter the enterprise. So let's start the configuration like this. I'm going to create policy maps. Inside these policy maps, I have class maps. Based on the scenario, I can uh, understand what type of class maps I need. Here right now, I need a class map that matches either HTTP or FTP for any internet user. And I'm going to put this under the policy map and I make sure that the traffic is inspected. I'm not using pass because this traffic is not unidirectional. Basically, HTTP and FTP are TCP connections, so they are bidirectional. And I need to make sure that they are either inspected or both, uh, both sides allow this type of traffic to pass, but inspect is a more secure approach for this. Uh, for DMZ to internet, any traffic can go. So I have a class map that matches any traffic, or I can use no class map for this. But actually, I have another one that matches DMZ users. Uh, from DMZ to enterprise, I need to match SQL Server traffic, and of course, DMZ users once again. And um, from enterprise to DMZ and from enterprise to internet, I allow any type of traffic. But again, I'm inspecting all of those. So let's start with one of these. I'm going to show you a pattern to to easily configure this. I'm not going to miss anything. But first of all, I need to configure the zones. So I go to configuration mode and I type zone security. And next thing I need to assign a name for that. Internet is one of the zones. Exit. The next one is going to be enterprise exit and the next one is going to be DMZ exit okay let's go for the class maps first of all I want to allow internet users to uh, to to reach the HTTP and FTP servers so first of all I need a class map that matches HTTP and FTP and also I need a class map that matches uh, internet users that's going to be easy so I just go with an IP access list. Uh, this IP access list can be of type extended or uh, standard, it doesn't matter. I just use extended here and I name it Internet Users. And under this, I'm paying IP traffic from any to any. And you can see that from this traffic, I'm going to allow only HTTP and FTP using the other type. So let's go for a class map. 
The class map is of type inspect. This is very important to use inspect keyword here because only this type of class map can be used for zone based firewall. And the name is going to be internet users. You can see that I use the same name for access list and the class map uh, so that I can easily recognize them. So this one matches an access list that is used using access group keyword here access group and the name is going to be internet users okay this is the first one I forgot to type name here that's it okay I need another class map here this class map can match an access list again but under class map I can match HTTP or FTP again the type is going to be inspect and I am matching either HTTP or FTP so I just type match any and I name it HTTP FTP hit enter and what I'm going to do is to match with protocol HTTP and match protocol FTP that's it now I need uh, another class map this class map is a combination of the two class maps that I just created uh, this one is of type inspect and I'm going to name this like this uh, the name is going to be internet DMZ okay hit enter inside of this I'm going to match with a class map that I just created uh, the class map name was uh, internet user this is a class map and because I didn't use match any match all is default and it is going to kick in and the next one is going to be HTTP and FTP hit enter now I have a class map here that matches internet users that uh, use HTTP and FTP and if they use another type of protocol I, they are not going to be allowed because this class map is of type match all okay now I use a policy map here this policy map again is of type inspect and uh, that's going to be again uh, internet to DMZ hit enter I'm going to use this class internet to DMZ and I'm going to inspect the traffic I can drop it, I can policy it, I can pass it but inspection is a better idea okay now the next step is to create the zone pair the zone pair is created like this zone pair security the next thing is a uh, name internet to DMZ and it needs a source the source is internet zone that we created and the destination is DMZ zone that we created and inside this I'm going to use a service policy that means a policy map and it's going to be service policy type inspect and the name is internet to DMZ and hit enter okay everything is done the only thing not down is to assign interfaces to this um, to this zone I'm going to do that later but you can easily um, you can easily follow everything here and you can see that what I have done I need to do the same thing for the rest of my configuration I do this in next section so let's save the configuration first and continue in next section In previous section, I configured Zombies Firewall on router 2. What I'm going to do here is to extend the configuration. So let's first check the running config of the policy maps. So run section policy maps. And now these are the policy maps that I created. The first one policy map is internet to DMZ. It had a class and it inspected the traffic. Now this inspection, this is kind of uh, very similar to what we had in CBAC. CBAC had 
this type of configuration. If I go to configuration mode and type IP inspect, now IP inspect. Uh, we had these possibilities. We could limit the number of connections that are incomplete in a one minute. We could limit the number of incomplete connection in total. We could have um, you know a limited number of incomplete connections for TCP and UDP per host, and we could block that host if it uh, if it you know um, had more than you know the number of connections that we allowed in this configuration. The same thing can be applied to zone-based firewall because we are inspecting so we expect to see such thing here but uh, we cannot use a profile of CBAC inside here. Instead what we are using is a parameter map. So I just type parameter map and this parameter map is of type inspect so I have to type type inspect and then I'm going to give it a name ZBF for example and now under this configuration you can see the same options max incomplete one minute and TCP and UDP and of course we can limit the number of sessions as well so let's just start doing that I'm going to limit the number of sessions to something around 3000 this is based on the resources on my router I'm going to have limited resources on my router so I'm not going to have more than this uh, this much the session maximum is 3000 for one minute I'm going to have a low value of 100 so if my incomplete connections per minute is not going to exceed 100 I'm not going to drop them but if they exceed 200 I'm going to start drop them until they come to as low as 100. Uh, for total, max incomplete, the low value for total is going to be 500. Huh? And the high value is going to be 800 for my configuration, of course. You should decide based on the resources on your router. And uh, these are the configuration that I'm going to have. I can have TCP connections per host so I just type TCP maxim complete per host and I'm not going to have let a host to have more than 40 incomplete connections and if they exceed this I'm going to block them for two minutes okay now I can use this under policy map configuration so I type policy map type inspect internet to DMZ for this class I'm going to inspect but I'm going to use a parameter name parameter map name and that's ZBF and hit it. That's it. This is the way that you use a parameter map inside a policy map of type inspect. Now do you remember something else? We could inspect the traffic we could drop it we could let it pass but of course we could have policy enabled. Now for policy, and I'm going to use one of these policy maps to check that configuration. For example, from enterprise to DMZ, I'm going to policy the connection because uh, from other uh, from other zones, I do not have um, ICMP traffic, and I'm going to test it using ICMP traffic. So I just type policy under this. But you can of course policy the connections from different zones. So what I'm going to use is to type police and rate. For police rate, I have a rate of 1,024,000. And I can have a burst. I can leave it alone. 64,000 for burst and hit enter. That's it. Now let's see the running config of policy maps. For this, we are inspecting using a parameter map. For this one, we are policing the rate. Okay, now if I type to show policy map, type inspect, 
and for each zone pair and of course I can type the name of the zone pair for example e internet to DMZ you can see information about that service policy is internet to DMZ the class is matching HTTP and FTP and the class map for internet users and the rest of the you know information that you have here if there is a session you can see that session as well so let's try to create a session here if I go to router 4 and try to telnet 10 10 3 on a port 80 now you can see that it says connection refused and I do not see a session here because the connection was refused but if I had the connection I could have seen the session here now let's go and start the ping from router 1 to router 3 so this ping 3333 3, 3, 3. you can see that I am uh, I am having a lot of you know pings timeout is as low as possible and you can see there is a very big size selected for this ping this means that if I hit enter these pings are going to timeout very easily now if I go to router 2 and type enterprise to DMZ and hit enter now you can see some information about policy you can see that it says 500 packets confirmed 641 did not conform they exceeded and they were dropped of course and you know they exceed but first uh, bit per second is 28,000 and these are information about the policy and everything that we just configured and uh, there's something else I just remember to type it let's go to this mode I'm going to type show parameter map type inspect and this is the command that you use to check the information for your parameter map